Okay. You're good. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Hello, everybody, and thank you all for being here today. I would like to welcome you to the second session of the Climate Change and Maritime Heritage Interdisciplinary Perspectives International Virtual Conference. Once again, thank you to all of you who made this event possible. To begin, as this is a virtual conference and is being held with participants around the world, we would like to recognize all indigenous peoples and their continuing connections to the land, waters, and community. We pay our respects to all indigenous peoples and their cultures and to the elders, both past and present. I would now like to recap the events that took place yesterday during our first session of the conference. First, Dr. Randy Larson, Professor of Chemistry and Program Coordinator for the Environmental Studies Department at St. Mary's College of Maryland, spoke on the new marine science program at SMCM and at how it has the ability to aid in climate change related research and address how climate change has the potential to negatively affect maritime heritage. Then Dr. Tom Dawson, Principal Research Fellow in the School of History at the University of St. Andrews in Scotland, presented on recording heritage along Scotland's eroding coasts and how Scape Trust has been working with communities to locate and record coastal and intertidal sites. Dr. Dawson discussed how Scape is now working to update their websites and heritage recording app for their next projects. Then Dr. Canizzo, or Zachary Canizzo, with the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation in support of NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries and NOAA's Climate Program Office, and Ms. Madeline Roth, CPC under contract to NOAA's Maritime Heritage Program, focused their presentation on incorporating climate change into the management of NOAA's federally protected underwater maritime heritage and cultural resources. Then Dr. David Anderson, Professor of Anthropology at the University of Tennessee, presented on addressing climate change and the loss of cultural heritage through the perspective of the Southeastern United States. Then Ms. Christina Gaithel, PhD candidate and researcher at the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Studies, discussed the effects of ocean acidification on Pacific Arctic bivalves and implications for maritime heritage. She spoke on the lessons that can be learned from studying the biological communities in the rapidly changing Pacific Arctic and how these lessons are important to a maritime communities when wrecks are found and preservation is required for ships and associated artifacts. Second to last, Dr. David Gregory, senior researcher and visiting research professor with the National Museum of Denmark, focused his presentation on how climate change and the spread of growth of wood boring organisms can degrade underwater cultural heritage. Dr. Gregory gave a brief overview of how these wood degrading organisms affect wood and underwater archeology span in general, and how climate change is affecting their distribution within European waters. Lastly, Ms. Geneva Wright, Senior Lead Underwater Archeologist with Defense POW slash MIA Accounting Agency, Partnerships and Innovations, presented on an ontology of the USS Arizona's preservation in a changing climate. She explored the available research on the USS Arizona, identified areas where integration with climate data can improve understanding of the wreck's preservation, as well as how this wreck can help us grasp with the complex interaction of rapidly changing maritime environments as well as shipwrecks containing pollutants and basic corrosion parameters. Today, we are joined by six talented speakers organized by Dr. Deb Sheffy in Australia. Um, actually, it's actually six presentations, not speakers. 
These speakers will be discussing climate change and its impacts on maritime cultural heritage through an interdisciplinary perspective and collaborative approach. During this conference session, each speaker will present for 20 minutes on a topic related to climate change and maritime heritage. 10 minutes of questions and answers will follow each presentation. These presentations will be followed by a discussion period led by Dr. Deb Sheffy, focused on present and future actions needed to mitigate the negative effects of climate change and its impacts on maritime archaeological resources. A closing remark statement at the end of this discussion period will mark the conclusion of this conference. Before we begin, I would like to lay out some very simple ground rules. First, please keep your microphone muted to eliminate background noise. Questions may be added by our conference attendees to the chat box for our wonderful presenters here today during the question and answer session. And we will address as many of these questions as possible during this 10 minute period of time. I also ask that all attendees please turn off your cameras in order to save bandwidth use to ensure presentations run smoothly. Lastly, I ask that everyone is respectful and considerate during the question and answer period and throughout the conference. With that, I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Deb Sheffy, who is the Assistant Curator at the Western Australian Museum, and she will be introducing our first speaker of this session. Thank you very much, McKenna, um, and thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, <laughs> Vicky has very quickly left the building. Um, we just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and for McKenna, thank you for putting together such a fantastic two day program. So our first speaker today will start off is Dr. Kurt Bennett. Um, he's a maritime archaeologist from the Australasian Institute for Maritime Archaeology or AMA. Um, and Dr. Bennett will be presenting on today's footprints, tomorrow's losses. AMA and the UN Decade Ocean Science. Over to you, Kurt. All right, thank you very much. Um, I will attempt to share the screen. <laughs> if it works. Okay. this goes to plan. All right. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. So well, let, let me know if there's any issues as I go through. Um, but yeah, hopefully it'll run um, yeah, as intended. Uh, I just think it's just so cool. It's just looking at through um, who's attending the conference at the moment. Uh, um, yeah. Just blown away that uh, it's truly a global uh, conference and I think that's pretty cool we can all come together and discuss things that um, we're passionate about so um, good morning and <laughs> good evening to those around the world um, I'm currently based in New Zealand so it's midday here and um, today I'll be talking to you on behalf of AMA which is the Australasian Institute for Maritime Archaeology and um, and looking at how we want to get involved um, with uh, I guess with the uh, with the ocean decade, a UN ocean decade, and um, also engaging just uh, communities and to bring that forward um, into the front of our minds. So the impacts, uh, my notes have disappeared. <laughs> the impacts of a changing environment on maritime cultural heritage are not a new phenomenon. Archaeologists, geologists, marine scientists have been researching the paleo landscape and the impacts of past climate events for decades. And to date, however, our understanding of how contemporary changes on a global scale are and will impact our um, maritime sites remains ambiguous. And although the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development being uh, from 2021 to 2030 does not specifically address cultural heritage, it does provide the scope for interdisciplinary and international collaboration. So today I'll, I'll briefly introduce AMA, uh, the organization. 
for those of you who are unfamiliar with the, um, with the group. In summarise, where cultural heritage aligns with key aspects of the UN decade of ocean science. And to speak to the capacity building and collaborative opportunities um, moving forward. So where AMSC sees um, this going in our region. That worked. So what is AMA? It's the Australasian Institute for Maritime Archaeology. It's a non not for profit community based organization formed to promote the advancement of interest in maritime archaeology and maritime archaeological research in Australasia. So Australasia mostly encompass, encompassing Australia and New Zealand. So it's based um, mostly in Australia with the, the exec and um, the day to day running, um, but it has sponsored work throughout the wider region, including Asia, India, and um, the Pacific Ocean. And who belongs to AMA? Our membership is, uh, involves quite, quite a number of different professionals, as well as just avocational people who have general interest in, in history and our maritime heritage. And it can involve, um, well, it does involve divers and non-divers. So because we have underwater sites, um, but also maritime sites on land. And so this can include also professionals um, being maritime archeologists as well as terrestrial archeologists. Um, it also includes conservators, um, historians, both professional and amateur um, photographers that just wanna get out um, yeah, and document and record um, our underwater cultural heritage. Interested people, just have a general interest to come forward, um, want to sign up and learn a bit more about what sites are around them. And of course, uh, volunteers um, being not-for-profit, we, we rely heavily on our volunteers. So uh, it's a varied um, <coughs> range of, of members that belong to our group. And, and with that, it, it brings a whole range of different um, experience and knowledge. Um, so what are AMA's objectives? So to preserve our maritime heritage, to support and undertake scientific research, to promote the advancement of maritime archaeology in Australasia, to provide education, training and information, to improve techniques of surveying and recording, excavation and conservation, to promote publications. So it has an annual um, journal that comes out every year and to involve divers and non-divers, like I said, um, it's not just restricted to underwater sites, it's still have terrestrial based sites. The last three I put in bold because it, uh, actually, I, I believe these reflect um, what I'm addressing today. And these are to promote international cooperation in the excavation of maritime archaeological sites and the research and studies related to this field. To cooperate with Australian state and New Zealand maritime archaeological associations and any other body or person having similar aims. And I'll just point out, um, so within Australia and New Zealand, there are smaller groups that might be more localised to either states or regions um, within the two countries that might just look at um, more, more local sites more um, rather than uh, nationwide studies. So for example, here in New Zealand, we have one called MANS, um, which is the Maritime Archaeological Association of New Zealand, and they're just a small um, volunteer group based in Wellington. And the third point is to cooperate with Australian state and federal organisations working in the field of maritime archaeology, because we still have um, legislation that enforces this on a, on a federal and state level in Australia and as well as New Zealand on a national um, level. So we want to engage with those, those professionals at a higher level um, yeah, to, in order to protect and to promote our underwater cultural heritage. So the UN Decade of Ocean Science in 2016, uh, the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission initiated a campaign which culminated in the Decade of Ocean Science. It's been um, basically from now until 2030. <clears throat> and in short, a um, couple of points. Uh, the vision of the ocean decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. And so the mission is to catalyze transformative ocean science solutions for sustainable development, connecting people and our ocean. And seven outcomes um, that, for the ocean that we want is at the end of the ocean decade, 
on a matrix outlining um, 17 frameworks that encourage stakeholders to take action and implement these on a voluntary basis within the legal framework of UNCLOS. So it just seeks to address um, the multiple stress stresses on global marine systems and um, manages sustain um, sorry manages them sustainably through ocean observations and research. So how does AIMA plan to support the decade of ocean science in Australasia? I want to raise awareness um, within the community as well as on that um, organisational level. I want to facilitate collaboration and communica communication across disciplines and stakeholders. We want to provide a platform for information sharing, um, support interdisciplinary marine research, encourage participation by archaeologists, heritage managers, conservators and marine scientists locally and regionally, and support national programs inspired by the UN decade. So like the Ocean Decade, Ocean decade Heritage Network, which was established in 2019, with the broad purpose of raising awareness about the UN decade and the cultural heritage community and coordinating a target, targeted global response for, from the community to improve the integration of archaeology and cultural heritage management um, within the marine sciences. So keep thinking back, um, AIMA has a large and varied um, membership base, which we can start to draw on. And we can also provide a platform, we've got a website, um, we can lobby towards governments. Um, so we're, we're very much interconnected with a lot of stakeholders and people, communities as well. Um, yeah, that we can offer that platform for communication and to open that discussion. So that brings us to the regional capacity building. <clears throat> Lost my notes again. <laughs> Where are we? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's an opportunity um, to engage in the global action campaign ring to Australasia, we want to help drive innovative programs, um, provide scholarship opportunities for collaborative research projects, um, which AIMA currently does offer an annual scholarship um, to promote maritime archaeology, um, develop mentoring programs. So again, just draw on the ex expertise that the, the membership holds ocean literacy and the synergenic relationship between cultural and natural heritage. Um, <clears throat> and again, that, that's addressing, we want to speak to the organisational level and then get that flow on effect to the community. So Australia, um, for example, has MOUs with countries in the wider region. So think back to so that Southeast Asia, Pacific regions, um, which provides an impetus to look at uh, protecting at, at risk shared heritage within that wider region. And again, provide a platform for inclusive conversations regarding stewardship and care of the ocean and the cultural heritage. So it's just really just getting people involved, making them aware of what's around them and how that the environment is changing around them, how it's affecting the heritage. Um, and in this case, the underwater heritage. Because once it's gone, it's gone. So we're gonna to look to um, collaborate. Um, and, and to do this, uh, we want to integrate with the smart technology, sensors, digital technology. So things, think, think along the lines of photogrammetry. It's reasonably um, cheap to establish or it's cost effective um, for communities to engage with, go out, start recording their sites, um, and then just start building up this database of how the site is changing over time. And that way we can, as AIMA, we can come and teach um, teach communities or people who are interested uh, these methodologies. So engage with the com coastal communities, industries and heritage managers. So it's not just maybe people who live coastal. Uh, we want to engage with those people who actively um, enforce uh, legislation within those areas. So bring everyone up onto the same um, playing field. We want to partner with industries and technology to help that help drive that holistic understanding as well. Yeah. 
So what AIMA wants to do, um, and this is what we can bring to the table. So we want to seek, uh, we want to find out these impacts of climate change and underwater cultural heritage. How are um, maybe seasonal cyclones impacting these sites? Are they degrading them or uh, do we find that the natural environment is starting to colonize them more and protect them? So these are sort of questions raised. We want to bring professionals to the discussion, so not just within the membership base, we want to extend that out, um, again, to those people in the, the higher levels, and make available in return our expertise in the membership group. I think back, we've got divers, non-divers, but we've got archaeologists um, in a range of disciplines. We've got conservators, um, which offer a great source of knowledge on how the environment's changing um, through continual monitoring of uh, wrecks, but also just amateur historians, like they, they're out there, they're re researching, they can bring a, a different side, a different element to understanding these historic sites. So we wanna bring everyone together <clears throat> for that wider, um, wider discussion. And then of course, if we encourage people who live coastal or who have an interest, um, sort of like an, an adopt a rec approach, um, for example, we want them to go out and collect data, but also share that data back. So we start to build this almost um, national database that can be fed back into this UN um, ocean decade, showing how uh, the environment's changing in, in our region, in Australasia, and how that is affecting our sites. And of course, that data would be fed back in. Um, it would help uh, other marine sciences understand changes in the um, underwater world. So as an example, um, there are many, like several examples. We could almost do a separate conference on the changes on underwater cultural heritage in, Aus in Australia. But one example I'll draw you here is the foam shipwreck. It's located in Queensland. Um, it was a wooden schooner and it wrecked on the Great Barrier Reef. The, the ship itself was engaged in a labour trade at the time of wrecking. And so it made voyages between 1887 and 1892, um, before it wrecked in 1893. And foam is an important part of Australia's maritime heritage, particularly Australians of the South Sea Islander descent. And archaeological remains on the, on the site provide vital, uh, vital information um, about the ship itself. <clears throat> so it's, it's actually only located in about three to six metres of water. So very accessible for a lot of people, a lot of divers. Um, that might not have a lot of experience. So you think along those tourism lines as well. And, but the shallow nature of the site makes the wreck vulnerable to cyclones. So historic information of previous cyclones show that the foam has been in the path of at least 21 cyclones. The 2018 inspection uh, noted that the site has been impacted by climate change events, um, including, uh, but not limited to uh, coral bleaching. So I'll just point you to the left photo. This is showing that in 1982, um, <clears throat> the part of the structure there, and it's covered in living coral. Um, don't be fooled by the color, but that is, it's colonized by living coral, which then of course brings in wider fish species, almost a, a sort of a, a larger natural habitat. But then move, shift your eyes to the photo on the right, and it's completely destroyed. That is dead coral, and that's caused by one of the cyclones that came through. And there's two things here um, with, with climate impacts on underwater sites, such as the, as the foam. <clears throat> one, it's destroying a natural habitat. It's removing all these fish species, homes, nurseries, um, important parts uh, to life, and it's shifting all that away. It's destroyed it. But secondly, the coral that's colonised the wreck, in some ways brings it to an equilibrium where it can protect it uh, for long term. And by destroying that natural habitat, you're immediately destroying or speeding up the degradation of that site, especially in this case, it's a wooden shipwreck. It's no longer protected to um, large ocean currents or anything like that. So going forward, increased rates of cyclones or um, large maybe natural disasters, um, which I'm used to here in New Zealand, uh, can speed up the degradation of our underwater cultural heritage. So it's, 
So coming back to this idea that we want to get out there, we want to document, we want to record these sites and assess the changes. And this is the decade to do it. So we just feed back into that larger database. So where to next? Um, AMA, we came together as a small working group earlier or late last year. And we really want to get AMA involved. We want to bring this to the forefront um, for this decade. So we've got a small working group set up. And so this is where we've, we've started pitching these questions, you know, where to next, we've got, we've got a range of resources, we've got access to wonderful, knowledgeable people in our membership base, we've got connections to communities, um, individuals, uh, people within government. So we've got all these resources um, that we want to use, and we will, but because we're still young, at this, I guess, uh, we're, we're just still assessing where we want to go to next. And of course, we want to involve as many people as we can, because this is, yeah, the decade to do it. So we know who, yeah, who these things and what we want to do, uh, but where to go from here, um, that is the question. And we will, we'll just continue working on that. And I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, Kurt. What a great presentation. Nice. <laughs> so it's fantastic to learn that AIM as an organization is actually collabor collaboratively looking at the, the broader picture to see how they can engage in underwater cultural heritage and the issues with climate change. Um, we have time for questions. Um, <laughs> if there are, um, is anyone who has any questions for Kurt? Free, feel free to either type your questions into the chat box or just pop in and ask a question. I'll just point out that there are some other working group here, so. <laughs> Slightly <laughs> biased. jump in. <laughs> Look, I do, I mean, just in general for those in the Northern Hemisphere who aren't AIMA members, um, can you advise how people might be able to get engaged with AIMA or some of the work that AIMA is doing? Yeah, oh, sure. Um, yeah, so uh, actively seek members. So you can go online, um, look to join through our website, uh, even, even send an email to us and we'll forward you on to the right person uh, to get involved. Um, but uh, I did touch on, we have an annual scholarship, so that supports more local projects um, with research, mostly focused on maritime archaeology, but we want to also open that up to um, these climate change studies as well. So if you've got an idea that, um, yeah, that uh, looks at underwater cultural heritage within Australasia, um, but perhaps you might have a wider global uh, connection, that, that is possibly open um, for assessment uh, through the scholarship program. Um, but yeah, definitely get in touch. Uh, more ideas are better. That's great. Thank you, Kurt. Okay. Oh, All right, with that then, um, we've got a question for you, Kurt. Um, have you had a lot of success with citizen science projects and how are you trying to get more involvement from the public? Uh, I can't really comment on that. Uh, maybe someone else can, but my, my response would be that because we're a, a young working group like we only started in the last couple of months that we actually haven't actively gone out and seeked people to be involved yet so this is really just a starting point just to um, promote AIMA's involvement that we want to get AIMA engaged in these discussions and this is what AIMA can bring to the table. 
don't know if anyone else wants to add to that. Well, I think um, in general, AMA is a citizen science organization in a sense that um, it's a not for profit and a, a large body of the members are avocationals. So if uh, so in general, for the work that AMA does, it's quite a citizen science led organization. Um, and I believe working, moving forward, like Kurt said, with the UN decade being a focus for many nations around the world engaging in marine, with marine interests, that we will find that it, that citizen science angle will start to grow in terms of the data collection for science. Um, we've got another question for you, uh, Kurt. Um, is AMA planning on any activities that show the relevance of archaeology or UCH to sustainable development and addressing the impacts of climate change? And you can read the question in the chat if that helps. Yeah, um, again, I'll just like we haven't quite got there. Um, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, because I mean, it's just a working group that like we, we meet maybe once a month to this, discuss this. And so these are the next steps. Um, I think these are all really good ideas in terms of um, what the working group can do moving forward mm. with the AMA membership. Um, as you mentioned in your presentation that there are AMA members in a wide variety of industries and subdisciplines within the marine spectrum. And that would give us the chance to look at the sustainable development issues and um, other stakeholder interests in the marine space. So thank you very much for that suggestion. And we have a, a time for a few more questions if anyone has a question for Kurt. <clears throat> um, all right, thank you very much, Kurt. We really appreciate it. Um, no and worries, William. <laughs> No worries. All right, we'll just move on to the second presentation now. So we're, um, we'll give us more time for questions as we move on today. The second presentation is brought to you by Vicki Richards, uh, manager of the materials conservation department at the WA Museum, and myself, maritime archaeology collections manager and assistant curator for the WA um, Western Australian Museum. Um, and today we're going to talk to you about synergetic science, so climate change and maritime heritage. It's our turn to play share screen. That doesn't help, does it? If I could only use technology. Well, why do you think I'm sitting here? <laughs> <laughs> well done. I'm old. Apparently so am I. All right, let's try this again. Do we have success? Can somebody just confirm that yes, they can see? I can yep. see your slide. Yep, that's good. Excellent, thank you very much. All right, and we will just bear with us because again, we are technologically special. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so can you please still see our screen? Is that working? Okay, we can just see your notes instead of, oh, there it goes. There it goes. There it goes. Beautiful. <laughs> All right, that's much better. All right, so um, as this virtual conference is being held with participants around the world, we would like to recognize all Indigenous peoples and their continuing connections to land, waters, and community 
And as we are speaking on Wajak Nunga land, we'd like to pay our respects to their elders past and present. So for nearly half a century, maritime heritage managers and conservators have mapped, analyzed, documented, and visually documented shipwrecks and other maritime cultural heritage sites throughout Austra um, Australia and its territories. Now we therefore have a baseline understanding of the site formation processes, and in some cases, more extensive knowledge on the environmental factors impacting current state of equilibrium. However, there is a lack of understanding and how changes in the ocean's chemistry and thus the site environment um, will now impact site stability of maritime cultural heritage sites moving forward. So it's therefore the aim of today's presentation to introduce CTRAMP, an interdisciplinary study in its infant stages, which links data from marine science sectors and legacy data of the maritime cultural heritage sites to current and ongoing site research. We'll do our best to highlight how this holistic approach is applicable in a range of disciplines, and more importantly, whether a large scale interdisciplinary multi-site approach can even produce predictive or broad results. So you're gonna hear us talk about MCH or Maritime Cultural Heritage. And we're doing this because there's often that, that, that association with underwater cultural heritage and shipwreck sites. And our aim is to acknowledge that the Maritime Cultural Heritage is occurring not just underwater. It's not just shipwreck sites. We're talking about basically any of those areas that are impacted in, on, or around, or even under the sea and other navigable bodies of water. So coastal, um, rivers, etc. cetera. Um, obviously we can't do it all. So the majority of our sites here at the WA Museum and the legacy, legacy data that we've recorded in the past has been predominantly shipwrecks and um, aircraft. But our aim is to engage with enough researchers interested in intertidal, riverine, coastal, et cetera, um, to pull together a more comprehensive and holistic data set. So climate change, the big elephant in the room. Now, multiple climate studies around the world are coming to the similar conclusions and those of relevance really directly impacting maritime cultural heritage environments includes those that are listed on the screen. So our ocean temperatures and heat content around Australia and globally have steadily increased. Um, this has a big impact on the ocean's chemistries and thus impacting on marine biota. And as cultural heritage sites are often considered artificial reefs, we have this synergetic relationship between the natural and the cultural heritage. And thus both natural and cultural are impacted. We've got ocean acidity levels increasing. And again, ocean's chemistry changing. It can impact corrosion, marine biota, and again, multi a maritime cultural heritage. Our sea levels have risen around the world um, and thus amplifying the effects of high tides and storm surges. This plays a role in MCH site management in coastal areas and the anecdotal evidence is um, we've got that increased loss or exposure of coastal sites. Um, and this was even touched on day one when, um, day one of this conference when Dr. Dawson and Dr. Hamley spoke on the loss of the 50 meters of coastline in countless sites in Scotland overnight. So this is a very real threat and one that we're all quite aware of. And then of course, these changes are projected to continue. Um, and of course we have the project, um, projected changes and that you have more frequent, extensive, intensive and longer lasting marine heat waves. We've got fewer tropical cyclones, a greater proportion of high intensity storms with ongoing variation that will occur from year to year. So it isn't really a question of if a change in climate is going to impact maritime cultural heritage. It's more a question of how is it going to impact these sites. Oh, sorry, it's me. I fell asleep. <clears throat> Thanks, Vic. No worry. <laughs> so the vulnerability of uh, maritime cultural heritage sites to climate change demands that we improve our understanding of climate processes and uh, the implications for site preservation. Although we as practitioners have begun discussing the links between climate change and maritime cultural heritage, very few results and management strategies have been published to date. So there, there's a number of biological, chemical and physical parameters that can impact site stability. And dependent on the major material types present on a site, um, different in situ management strategies will be required to preserve our um, MCH. However, 
most importantly, which of these parameters are indicators of changes in site stability and which are indicators of climate change? And most importantly, what are the measurable parameters that indicate the effect of climate change on the stability of maritime cultural heritage sites? So, thanks, Deb. So just for example, if we look at ocean acidification, increasing levels of dissolved carbon dioxide in surface seawater has ca caused a measurable decrease in the ocean pH. This acidification of the ocean has the potential to negatively impact the stability of multiple, um, maritime cultural heritage sites, especially metal structures and shipwreck remains by decreasing concretion thicknesses their pipe um, increasing corrosion rates. There's obviously a lot of other effects, but that's just one example. Um, next one, Deb. So changes to ocean circulation and increases in global temperatures has the potential to affect the climate. And there is evidence of increases in extreme weather events um, occurring around the world. For example, what you can see here, is this is a Daihatsu landing craft in Saipan um, in 2012. And here it is in 2017. In 2015, a super typhoon called Sudalor um, went through the Philippines and Saipan to, um, and, and destroyed this site completely. What's really interesting to note is that we've been measuring the corrosion um, parameters on these sites um, since 2012, um, I think, or before that. Anyway, we've got legacy data, and what it showed was this particular site had no uh, residual metal left. However, another site, similar Daihatsu landing craft, uh, about 100 metres away in the same um, depth, um, actually had resi residual metal and it wasn't affected um, by the typhoon except losing a bit of coral and that sort of thing. So, so it, it would have been possible for us to predict which of these sites would be more susceptible to increases in excessive water movement um, than other sites in that general area. So it's interesting. So you're going to see a bit, sorry, Dave. <laughs> um, biological degradation is the primary cause of uh, deterioration of wooden under, um, underwater cultural heritage structures exposed above the seabed. Um, so this damage is caused mainly by um, marine mollusks such as teredo worms. Um, it weakens the wood and then it's more susceptible to uh, continued damage by physical means um, such as increased water movement. Um, so European funded projects such as Dave Gregory's SASMAT and uh, Rec Protect projects have been researching the infiltration of these marine worms, namely Torito navalis, into the Baltic Sea, where they're becoming more prolific uh, due to climate change and thus threatening the longevity of uh, wooden undercultural heritage sites. Um, similarly, in the UK, there's been a noticeable northern migration in, of um, invasive species such as the black tip shipworm and an increase in distribution of zebra mussels in uh, northern US and Canada. Um, so this table here just identifies some of the um, environmental parameters um, that affect the development of larval and adult stages of Torito novalis. Um, based on the literature outlined in Dave's Rep Protect um, project. So uh, they then imported known legacy data for these listed environmental parameters from 1980 to 2008 into an ArcGIS model and predictively modelled those parameters from 2009 to 2020 that influenced the, the formation or the um, settlement of Torino Navalis larvae in the Baltic Sea. From there, <clears throat> the project then produced a predictive threatened area map that you can see here 
on the left, the red areas um, from the environmental legacy data and the predictive models from 1980 to 2020. So what you can see here is any of the wrecks in this red area um, are going to be affected by increased um, Torito worm um, production. And these ones obviously up here aren't going to be as affected as, as much. So this is what we're looking at, predictive modeling um, from legacy data. So what you can see here for decades, um, we've been taking you know, undertaking on-site conservation surveys on numerous maritime cultural heritage sites to gather as much environmental and chemical information as possible to help us understand the stability of um, these MCH sites. So this is a lift, list of the parameters that we attempt to measure on every maritime cultural heritage site we visit. Obviously not all parameters are applicable to all sites like corrosion parameters aren't applicable to wooden shipwrecks and the measurements we take on wooden shipwrecks aren't necessarily applicable to iron um, or metal structures. But we just try and get as much information as possible on every site. This is the world map that indicates some of the maritime cultural heritage sites where on-site conservation surveys have been conducted by the WA Museum. Um, so you can see there's a significant amount of legacy data that we have associated with mar maritime cultural heritage sites in Australia and abroad um, that can be used as comparative baseline data. But the first step is to amalgamate all the data into a useful and potentially comparable format, which is can be quite uh, daunting. <laughs> um, so as site-specific environments, they vary so much between sites, uh, it's unlikely we're going to be able to compare the data directly. It's therefore necessary, necessary to identify pivotal parameters to measure on maritime cultural heritage sites to see if we can obtain a broader understanding of how the current climate will impact the stability of maritime cultural heritage sites. So for example, on a shipwreck site, uh, a metal shipwreck, important pam parameters to measure, you know, from a stability point of view would include the corrosion potential, the pH of the residual metal surface, the depth of concretion and corrosion layer, the water depth, the dissolved oxygen content of the water column, the salinity, and the overall water movement on the site. Then we need to identify which of these parameters are important for indicating climate change. So that might be the depth of concretion and corrosion, which is an um, uh, indicator of ocean deacidification, the water depth, which is sea level indicator, dissolved oxygen content, which is sea temperature indicator, salinity, sea temperature and oceanic circulation indicator, overall water movement, which is the sea level and oceanic circulation indicator. So then we can look at how these particular parameters can assist in predicting the effect of climate change on the stability of maritime cultural heritage sites and thereby inform on suitable long-term management strategies. Back to Deb. Brilliant. So it comes down to um, where do we start? As Vic said, it, it's somewhat daunting to, uh, to gather all of the data. But based on the science, the history, the experience, we know that the biological, physical, and chemical changes that are occurring um, and the, the variety of factors impacting sites will continue to change. Um, so although the research topics relating climate change and archeological sites does exist, exist it's predominantly focused on um, it's predominantly site specific. And what we're interested in are these broader comparisons with the aim of being able to see if we can make predictive statements. Um, we recognize a major change, uh, that the, the major challenge, I'm sorry, is that global, regional and local climate change impacts may be obvious in some cases. You've got coastal erosion, um, for example, um, but they're very difficult to measure or predict in others. So we still don't actually know if the biological, chemical, and physical data will actually lend itself to generalizations 
or whether or not there are too many factors impacting a site specifically to understand change beyond site specific perspectives. But this is, I guess, where the Climate Change Heritage and Marine Processes Project, or CCHAMP as we like to call it, comes in. We've got to start somewhere. So we're starting by collating the decades of in situ and conservation survey data from sites around the world to see if or what that data actually shows us. Um, and as Vic said, we can't, we can't um, compare the quantitative aspects of it. So we're having to compare the qualitative interpretation of this data. Um, so if we haven't gotten in contact with you yet and you have in situ measurements from sites that you're happy to share with us, um, please do get in contact with us. Um, from our own legacy data, we recognize that a lot of the baseline data um, is spotty in some senses where we focused on one aspect of the um, data collection, but for example, we don't necessarily have an uh, ongoing biological assessment of a site. So what we're trying to do is as we're collating this data, we're looking to see where we might have gaps in our baseline knowledge so that we can start to fill in those gaps for sites that we can more easily access. Um, we've got aquatic zoologists at the WA Museum and they've recommended identifying a handful of species to monitor at each site um, to see if, how, and what is actually happening to the flora and fauna as a result of the changing marine environment. We'll aim to monitor um, if there is an increase in, in um, invasive species or a decline or increase for that of native species seasonally, et cetera. So whilst we collate the legacy data, we recognize that because data was collected using different methods or different equipment over time, it is that we need to quantitatively assess the site and then look at that qualitatively again. Um, so where does this desktop, desktop study actually take us? Uh, so our aim is to start with a two-year pilot study after we finish our baseline legacy data, um, hopefully uh, in starting in 2022, where we visit a half a dozen of our local shipwreck sites um, and we'll uh, visit them seasonally to actually monitor the identified key factors um, and record any changes in the site. Um, should this pilot study actually prove warranted, we'll then expand this idea to other sites in different environments within our jurisdiction. Um, and we expect, we assume, we hope to actually have results that warrant that further uh, research. So to date, there are other researchers domestically and abroad who have agreed to parallel this study with, uh, within their local waters to help to see if we can begin to generate that global comparable data with the hopes of determining if we can or maybe we determine we actually can't generalize how climate change is and will impact um, maritime cultural heritage sites broadly. For some of our maritime heritage, of course, it's too late. We've had that coastal erosion. Um, we've had major storm events which have destroyed sites. For others like large oil carrying vessels, World War II ships, decommissioned oil wells and platforms, time is ticking. And as many of the presentations you heard on day one, and you will hear today on day two, we'll note that the pollutant side of the impacts of climate change on cultural heritage um, underwater is, is a huge issue. Um, at the end of the day, we don't know what we don't know. So our aim is to try and find out. So again, if you're interested in paralleling the uh, pilot study that we're doing, or if you're happy to contribute to the legacy data set, please get in touch with either Vic or myself. Be a champ. And join us. Thank you. <laughs> all right, so we'll see if there are any questions. Um, all right, let's see. Are there any questions for Vic or myself? Let's see what's this one. Um, do you want to read that one out? <laughs> what are you pointing to? This one here. Which one? Oh, in the case of the uh, Daihatsu Landing Craft um, 3, there's been a lot of typhoons since it sank. So do you feel there has been a shift in the trajectories or the paths of these storms or is it all due to an increase in intensity of storms? I think it's the increase in the intensity of the storms and the frequency. Um, because uh, when I was looking at the data and looking at typhoons, it has basically increased exponentially 
um, across that area, especially in um, the Philippines through that sort of trough that moves down, so, or up. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I think it's in both, increase in intensity and frequency. Just go, wait. Uh, Deb will read Dave's out. Hey, Dave. <laughs> All right. So, um, oh, thank you for the comment, uh, Dave. Um, data sets are available from the European National Databases, um, and they're already standardized, which is fantastic. So we will get those links from McKenna and see about incorporating that data into this um, broader assessment. Yep, we've been looking at those as well. Yep. Oh, so we've got a question. Um, how much of the work concerning future modeling is um, visibly reliant? Uh, in Maryland, the water is very cloudy, and would this be an issue? Do you need to be able to see the site in order to take your measurements? Absolutely not. <laughs> I can tell you that from experience on the James Matthews that has crappy visibility. <laughs> probably about five centimeters. If you can see five cent, if you can see your underwater box, you can take your measurements. Yeah. Not a problem. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Why do people think that Western Australia has beautiful, clear, lovely water? <laughs> Wishful thinking. Yeah. We should thank you. Right. Are there any other questions for Vic and myself? No. Lovely. Oh, wait. Are you using marine geophysics and photogrammetry for monitoring? Uh, mm, uh, photogrammetry, we've only just started using yeah. um, in the last, what, few years? Yeah. Um, and because I'm not particularly good at it, that's one of the issues is because we have to take someone that knows what they're doing because that's not a skill set I have. And geophysics, I think we'll be looking into that when we um, grab the marine scientists on board, um, you know, from UWA and that sort of thing. So that's what, you know, again, a bit out of my um, area of expertise, um, but we hope to. Yeah, we do. I think yeah. it's one of those where we've, as we've started to put together the Sea Champ program, we have um, been liaising with marine scientists and oceanographers, marine biologists, etc. And to find where that common ground is between what um, the in situ conservation uh, surveys have been collecting data wise and what climate change experts are interested in, what oceanographers and coral experts are interested in. And what we have found is that there's an overlap in the basic in the, the factors which are being recorded. It's just the use of that data and what that data means for the individual researchers. That's what varies. So our aim is to establish what are those uh, preliminary factors, or what, was, what were the terms that you used? Um, pivotal factors, there we go. The pivotal factors which are core across a range of disciplines. And that way we can work together to actually obtain a more holistic understanding of what is happening um, to sites, to environments, to the relationship between that, the cultural material and the, the, the natural heritage, as well as what's changing on that broader scale. So, and photogrammetry, of course, is a phenomenal way to record changes in environment full stop. What you don't necessarily get is that um, understanding of the marine um, biology side necessarily with photogrammetry um, when you're looking from that microscopic to pelagic species change and seasonal changes um, because as the fish move, the photogrammetry program omits them, which is handy. Um, but it is a phenomenal recording tool and one that you're gonna hear all about and shortly in <laughs> from uh, Andy Viduka. Ah, you're welcome. Are there any um, other questions for us? Ah. <laughs> he doesn't know it yet. That's fantastic. Just drop, <laughs> just drop us an email um, and we'll be, we're excited the more the merrier. We think that one of the nice things about uh, an, a, a conference such as this is that everyone who's participating 
um, in this two-day program is interested in the same result, which is understanding and mitigating climate change and the impacts of that on our um, heritage. So the more the merrier. Thanks, Nugget. <laughs> okay. Um, so we will move on to, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, but I think all the presenters are here, so it shouldn't be a problem. We'll move on to the next presenter, who is Dr. Matt Carter. Let me just exit this here. Just bear with me as I am very technologically special. <laughs> all right, so our third presenter today is um, Dr. Matt Carter, who's the research director for the Major Projects Foundation. Um, and Dr. Carter will be presenting on climate change and potentially polluting wrecks in the Pacific. So take it away, Matt. Right. Okay, just sharing my screen. Success. Can everyone see that? Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, looks good. Yeah. <laughs> Magic, thank you. So, um, yeah, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or uh, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, it's really amazing to be part of these these presentations, um, these these online forums where we can all connect uh, internationally. And so, I just want to uh, say my appreciation to McKenna and the rest of the team for putting this together. So, my presentation today is a um, it discusses the the toxic legacy of the more than 3,800 Second World War shipwrecks located throughout the Pacific region, and how climate change is not only impacting these underwater cultural heritage sites, but also multiplying the risk they pose uh, to the marine ecosystems, cultures, and livelihoods of the region. Right. Now, at this point, um, I'd like to acknowledge that this work is done um, in partnership between the Major Projects Foundation and the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environmental Program, SPREP. Now, for those of you who, who might not have heard of SPREP, it's a regional organisation uh, comprising the 21 Pacific Island member countries and territories, you can see in front of you here, and five developed countries. Um, and it's charged, SPREP is charged as an organisation with protecting and managing uh, the environment and natural resources of the Pacific, including the control of marine pollution. And that's how, how we're involved. Um, I'd also like to mention our developing partnership with the Ocean Foundation out of the US and the potential this represents for mitigating the threat that potentially polluting shipwrecks pose to the Pacific region. Uh, and finally, while, while I'm still doing introductions, um, I thought it'd be worth kind of putting a bit of information out there to, to say how I came to be investigating World War II shipwrecks. So as Deb uh, said before, I'm Dr. Matt Carter. I'm a maritime archaeologist, originally from New Zealand, uh, and you may be able to pick that up from my accent, um, but I'm now based in Melbourne, um, Australia. Now, since 2018, I've been the research director for the environmental not-for-profit organization, the Major Projects Foundation. Now, MPF was established with the mission of protecting marine ecosystems from potentially polluting shipwrecks, and also really importantly, building capacity within these Pacific communities to be able to respond to these threats themselves. So that's where I'm coming from today and will inform my, my presentation um, going forward. So you will have heard me mention the term uh, potentially polluting shipwrecks, PPWs. Now, um, I think it's worth providing a, a bit of a definition at this stage so that we're all on the same page. Now, at its most basic, uh, a PPW is any shipwreck that contains oil and or other forms of polluting substances. This is either as cargo or as fuel. So based on that definition, you know, basically any modern shipwreck is a PPW. But for the purposes of actually mitigating kind of the highest risk PPW, most organizations from the, around the world use a bit more of a, a strict definition, something like this in front of you here, um, that allows us to focus on those PPW 
which are deemed to pose a significant oil pollution risk. And here you can see this is based on the size of the vessel. So 400 gross tonnes, um, if it's a, a merchant vessel or a naval vessel, down to say 150 gross tonnes if it's a tank vessel. So just putting that into a bit of context. Now, this brings us back to the Pacific. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the Pacific War was a maritime war and it brought more people, equipment and machines, um, including ships and sailors, into the region than any other time in human history. So during this war, thousands upon thousands of, of ships were sunk and around 3,800 of those uh, fit that previous definition of potentially polluting wrecks being over 400 tonne uh, if they're merchant or naval and over 150 if they're tankers. And what you can see here from this map is uh, the general location of, of lots of these wrecks. It also, also shows the intensity of the major campaigns of that maritime war up through um, Melanesia, uh, Micronesia and up into the South Pacific, South, um, Southeast Asian area. Now, back in 2005, marine pollution experts investigated uh, the records of those 3,800 shipwrecks uh, to create estimates of just how much oil they may still contain. Now, through this work, they came up with a, a low estimate of around 150 million gallons and a high estimate of 1.2 billion gallons. Now, the likely volume of the oil in these wrecks is, is going to be somewhere in that range. But even if it is that low estimate, it's, it's a huge amount of um, oil potentially still on these wrecks throughout the Pacific and something that's really worth considering. Now, in terms of impacts, we all know that oil uh, in the marine environment is a bad thing. Um, and as you can see from the slide here, there are a whole uh, range of different impacts that, that oil will have on the marine environment, both short term and long term. And there's also multiple impacts that may have uh, negative impacts on social and cultural aspects of life. And this is particularly significant in a um, Pacific region uh, context. Uh, and also, obviously, oil spills are going to have a significant uh, economic impact to various nations' economies. So I guess from, from the previous slides, I've presented a bit of an idea of the scope and the scale that the threat um, of PPW pose throughout the Pacific. Now, a lot of the information is um, it's quite well known, but moving forward into the rest of my presentation, I'll discuss how climate change is impacting the wrecks, uh, these PPW themselves, and also acting to increase and even multiply the risk that they pose uh, to these Pacific Island countries and territories. Okay, so, so firstly, it's worth noting that in the Pacific, our potentially polluting wrecks from the Second World War, they've been underwater for at least 76 years. So they've been corroding in that environment for, for 76 years. Now, the level of preservation of these shipwrecks will depend on thousands of different variables, um, which were described previously by Deb and Vicky. Um, all these kind of, uh, these variables work inter interconnected to, to preserve or otherwise these shipwrecks. But what is consistent amongst all of them is that they are all corroding. All 3,800 of those shipwrecks are to some extent corroding and they will all eventually release the oil that they still hold. It's, it's, a matter, it's not a matter of if, um, it's a matter of when. And this brings us to the billion dollar question. You know, when will these 3,800 shipwrecks collapse? Now, the answer to this is we simply don't know for sure. But starting uh, in the early 2000s, um, corrosion scientists in McLeod Vicky Richards, who we saw before, and colleagues from the Western Australian Maritime Museum, they began working alongside uh, maritime archaeologist Bill Jeffrey up in Chuk Lagoon in the Federated States of Micronesia. 
And one of the questions they wanted to, to answer was exactly that, you know, how long till these shipwrecks collapse? So through their collection of corrosion data, they concluded that many of the wrecks in Chupagun will begin to undergo significant collapse between 2021 and 2025. So right this period that we're right in now. And as you can see from um, this slide in front of you, those predictions of collapse, they are being played out in Chuuk Lagoon. Um, you can see the bridge here of the Fujikawa Maru has collapsed, and these, these collapse are starting to become more common across the shipwrecks um, in the lagoon. Now, unfortunately, we don't really have comparable corrosion data for wrecks and other high-risk areas of the Pacific. But based on this work in Chuuk, um, and the fact that these 3,800 shipwrecks were all sunk within a short time period of one another, um, and also, I guess, general understandings of how iron and steel corrode in the marine environment, it's believed that we're entering what's, what's been termed a period called peak leak. And this is this idea that um, the oil within all these 3,800 wrecks will be released within around about the next 50 years. So the best preserved wrecks will be the last ones to, to release the oil uh, with the least preserves sooner. And it'll form a peak graph that we're all pretty familiar with. So this idea of, of peak leak and um, the looming time frame that we're, we're entering it now. But significantly, um, one of the challenges with all of this is that these previous predictions of, of corrosion rates, including that 50-year that time frame of peak leak, they're based on past rates of corrosion, measurable rates of, of what's happened in the past. The question now is what happens to this predicted rate when climate change um, alters the equilibrium of the environments in which the wrecks are located? Now, unfortunately, um, we don't have this data really to hand. It's still uh, a data set that we're trying to get um, an understanding of, but we can walk through the implications of what impacts climate change may have on the chemical and physical state of these PPWs. So firstly, um, marine scientists link uh, the increasing acidification of the ocean with climate change. Now, the long-term implications of changing chemistry on the potentially polluting wrecks, specifically that their surrounding environment uh, becomes more acidic. It's likely to impact the wrecks um, and increase corrosion in, in several ways. So firstly, uh, the lower pH will weaken the concretions and the coral structures that provide uh, protective coating uh, covering for the underlying iron and steel components of these rigs. Now, not only will this make these protective structures more susceptible to damage, but if they are knocked off by anchors or divers or other mechanical actions, then um, the, the more acidic conditions means it will take longer for that concretion and coral to reform. Um, and therefore, the wreck will continue corroding at a faster rate um, than in a more alkaline microenvironment. So yeah, overall, not, not a good result for our potentially polluting wrecks. Now, moving on to physical changes to potentially polluting wrecks due to climate change. Now, in the past 60 years, the Pacific region that, that we're talking about today has experienced more than 2,400 tropical cyclones, around 41 per year. And you can see them mapped onto that, um, that map there, uh, showing the, the magnitude. Now, significantly, the changing climate in the region, it's predicted to amplify the magnitude of these cyclones in the future. Now, Evidence already exists of cyclones causing damage uh, to potentially polluting wrecks in the Pacific, with the best examples again uh, coming from Chuuk Lagoon. Now, in 2015, cyclone uh, Maysac it generated waves that caused recordable damage to the wreck of the Fujikawa uh, Maru at a depth of 29, 29 meters, or around about 95 feet. So, the impact of these waves can be felt at quite considerable depth. 
But what is also worth noting here is that when building modern maritime infrastructure, such as oil platforms, uh, that kind of thing, marine engineers are now required to design against the impact of waves to a depth of at least 120 metres, so almost 400 feet. Now, this suggests to me that the increasing intensity of cyclones with the corresponding increase in wave strength has the potential to impact you know, the vast majority of potentially polluting wrecks throughout the Pacific, which are generally found in less than 120, less than 400 feet. So potentially a, a real devastating um, aspect to, to add to this um, changing equilibrium. Now, when we combine the predicted impacts of ocean acidification and stronger cyclones on potentially polluting wrecks in the Pacific, it's likely that these wrecks will be negatively impacted by these effects of climate change. Now, these impacts uh, are likely to ha hasten the rate at which these PPW reach structural collapse and release the oil they still hold. So perhaps um, we're not looking at a peak leak window of, of 50 years and may be significantly constrained from that. Okay, uh, so now that we've covered how climate change is likely to impact the preservation of PPWs in the Pacific, I want to discuss how the changing climate in these countries is acting to actually multiply the risk that oil spills from these wrecks pose. Now, I want to do this by briefly looking at, at three examples. Now, the first one of these is um, the impact of ocean acidification on food security. The second being um, ocean heat waves and coral bleaching. And the third, looking at disaster preparedness and resilience. Okay. So in terms of ocean acidification, the increasing acidity of ocean chemistry, uh, it will clearly not only impact the coral that's attached to potentially polluting reefs, but also nearby you know, adjacent reefs, natural reefs. Now, significantly, around 70% of protein in Pacific Islanders' diets comes from reef and lagoon fisheries. So not only will these reefs, um, these natural reefs, be weakened by ocean acidification, meaning they're less productive for fishing, but when an oil spill occurs from a PPW, the risk is that that already degraded reef will take much longer to recover from the spill than a comparable reef not suffering the impacts of ocean acidification. So in these ways, um, potentially polluting wrecks and the oil spills, they, uh, the impending oil spills from them, clearly have significant implications for, uh, for food security for particular areas of the Pacific and will act as this, this multiplier to to increase the damage that's already been caused by climate change. Now, the second example I want to discuss is ocean heat waves and coral bleaching. So due to increased water temperatures caused by climate change, many coral reefs throughout the Pacific are facing heat stress. And if this is not remedied, it can lead to coral bleaching and eventual coral death. Now, significantly for us, Coral bleaching typically occurs uh, during ocean heat waves that reach a depth of about 10 to 15 metres, so 30 to 50 feet. Now, the significance of this in relation to PPWs was identified by ecologist uh, Greg Asner while he was surveying corals on wrecks in Chook Lagoon and Bikini Atoll. Um, and due to the depth of these wrecks uh, being below that impacted by coral bleaching, he described these wrecks as arcs of coral biodiversity, where corals could survive bleaching events that would actually impact the shallow and natural reefs in the vicinity. Now, unfortunately, as with uh, ocean acidification, coral bleaching of the, the shallower adjacent reefs would also make them more vulnerable to the impacts of oil spills from the PPW. But this also has the kicker that the arcs of biodiversity themselves on top of these wrecks could potentially be just destroyed by spills from the very wreck that it's it's a part of. So it kind of a dual edged sword on, uh, sword on that one as well. And another example of how this can potentially multiply that risk. 
Now, the final example I want to discuss of how climate change is multiplying the risk of oil spills from PPW uh, is in relation to disaster preparedness and resilience. Now, as described um, previously, climate change is likely to increase the intensity of cyclones throughout the Pacific, and the waves generated from, from these, these cyclonic events have the potential to cause PPW to catastrophically collapse and release the oil that they contain. Now, in this context, um, emergency authorities, they, they are prepared uh, because they happen so frequently for cyclones. So they may be prepared to respond to this, this cyclone activity, start cleaning up and protecting people in that way. But the problem is that if this happens together with an oil spill from a PPW, um, even the most well-prepared and resilient Pacific nation is going to have to try to clean up that oil spill while managing the emergency systems, um, situation around the cyclone as well, which you know, it's going to be too much for, for any Pacific nation. So again, another example of how this is multiplying and um, causing significant challenges in this region. Okay, so um, bringing all this together, I guess my presentation today it has been mostly doom and gloom, um, showing the scale of the PPW threat in the Pacific. Uh, I've described how climate change is increasing the likelihood that PPW will collapse and release their oil in the near future. And I've provided some examples of how the damage from these oil spills may uh, actually be multiplied uh, and may multiply the impacts of climate change already being felt throughout the Pacific. But there is still hope. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we're working in partnership with SPREP and the Ocean Foundation to mitigate the threat these PPWs pose. And um, you know, we're always looking for, for new collaborators and partners for this work. So if you're interested in helping to tackle this, this urgent and critical threat, please get in touch. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Matt. That was a fantastic, um, depressing, but fantastic presentation. <laughs> um, we've got time. Does, uh, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Matt Carter? I'll, I'll, I'll start off with a question for you, Matt. Um, Obviously, economics plays a huge role in the recovery of oil from these uh, PPWs across the board. I can't imagine that it's um, an inexpensive exercise. But is there concern that once you've identified which of those PPWs are at higher risk for um, collapse and thus um, a catastrophic oil spill, is there concern that if you start removing the oil from um, the more vulnerable holes that they will collapse themselves and then cause an oil spill in the process? Yeah, um, it's, it's a really challenging situation. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, the ideal situation for this to be um, investigated was about 30 years ago, where you did still have a lot of um, structural you know, strength in these ships. So it definitely is a, um, a consideration that if, if you were to remove the oil using a process such as is hot tapping where you physically drill holes through the hull into the fuel tanks and pump it out. Um, there is that consideration that uh, the, the ship would collapse um, and the oil would be spilled out. But the flip side of that is, is that um, that kind of work, it, it sounds quite, um, quite involved and quite complicated, but it's actually bread and butter for salvage companies who do this kind of work all around the world quite regularly. Um, they pump out these ships quite frequently. So what they do have is they have um, you know, redundant systems and uh, booms and things that they set up around the wreck. So if it accidentally spills some of the oil, they will um, catch it. And an example of this was the, um, the US Navy actually pumped out a wreck called the, the Prinz uh, Eugen, a uh, former German warship. And they spilt, I think, four gallons of, of oil and removed you know, literally thousands, maybe even millions. So it can be done 
very, very well. Um, and just expanding on that um, briefly is that removing the oil is, um, you know, it's, it's the only way to actually remove the threat from, from the marine ecosystems. But in the short term, you can also do some concrete um, kind of practical means of minimizing the impact that these oil spills will have. And that comes back to what I briefly touched on um, about working with these specific communities to, to be able to counter this threat. And it can be as simple as going through their um, oil spill preparedness plans and updating them, um, auditing the, the equipment they have and finding out where the oil spills uh, from these wrecks are going to go so that they'll be able to be cleaned up as uh, efficiently and effectively as possible so to, to make that, that impact as small as possible. So there's a whole range of different ways that can be done. Thanks for that, Matt. We've got a few questions. Here's one for you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Matt, it's Vic. Um, what we seem to found is because these places are developing nations, um, they don't have the resources to spend, you know, on the the materials that they need to protect themselves from these potential oil spools. The other thing is that the countries that wrecks are in these um, these areas, I mean, they're not Pacific Islander wrecks. They're the US, they're Japan, they're Australia, and it seems like um, no one wants to take responsibility for that. Um, you know, the more the you know, the richer nations um, protecting the these developing um, nations. And that's what we sort of like um, ran into um, uh, a lot, especially in Chuuk, um, <clears throat> Saipan, Guam, you know, etc. cetera. Um, yeah. Is there, is, is your... Um, sort of project or anything looking at trying to lobby those uh, sort of nations? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's interesting because lobby has a, a different, um, I guess, understanding in Australia than it does to the US maybe. Um, so essentially what we're trying to do is work collaboratively. Uh, we're not going to hear anyone's kind of dirty laundry, but at the end of the day is that these Pacific Island countries didn't put these shipwrecks in their waters and are the ones who are going to have to suffer again through the, the environmental um, impacts. So what we're trying to do is, is basically get the information to have a, um, a case and say this wreck we think has this long well, estimates before it collapses, we believe it's holding this much oil, someone needs to do something about this. And it's in the past, uh, it's kind of been a um, a hot potato where no one wants to um, to hold it. But eventually, when these wrecks start going and multiple wrecks may, you know, if we have a, a significant cyclone event comes through Chuuk, there's 65 shipwrecks in Chuuk Lagoon, 19 of which are potentially polluted. It might be that one cyclone catastrophically collapses multiple shipwrecks. And, you know, no, no country in the world could actually deal with that. Um, let alone somewhere as far um, from uh, like salvage facilities as, as Chuuk. So it really comes down to, to mobilising that. And, and part of it is, is spreading the message and kind of talking to, to people like yourselves at events like this to get um, people aware of the issue and hopefully down the track that will bring in the resources needed to, to deal more adequately with it. But it is, it is a challenge. Thanks. Matt, the questions are just pouring in for you. Um, <laughs> I can't have done a very good job explaining it then. <laughs> You've done an excellent <laughs> job. That's why there's so many questions. Everyone's really engaged. Um, uh, do you also plan to look at sea dumping sites of chemical waste? Um, and are there, uh, there are several dozen sites off New South Wales, known as Plunkett, um, one of which the Royal Australian Navy has visited um, for us. So this is Brad's question. You can... Um, Read it in the chat if you'd like. Yep, yep, I've got it there, yeah. Um, and that's another thing. I mean, potentially polluting wrecks are just one side of the, the issue of this, this war-related, um, I guess, 
remains that are in the Pacific. So you go to countries like the Solomon Islands, um, and there are massive dumps of UXO, unexploded ordnance, uh, potentially even chemical weapons, uh, like Brad was saying. So it's definitely on our on our radar and something that I'm quite interested in myself. But specifically in Australia is that um, here we've got the resources to, to manage that more effectively than elsewhere overseas. So it's not a high priority for us. Um, because if something untoward does happen, then we do have the responses in place. Again, you go to the Solomons, they just don't have the, the resourcing or the special, like the expertise to respond accordingly. So something I'm definitely interested in, in looking at in the future, uh, but yeah, maybe, um, maybe down the track. That's great, thank you. Um, Nathan Rich has also gave us a great question. Yesterday, Geneva Wright um, mentioned that FEM modeling on uh, US Arizona and David Gregory talked about wooden samples for testing Toredo and Gribble damage. Do you know of anyone looking to do similar in situ or physics-based modeling on oil barrels to refine the spill present models? Um, I missed the presentation. I definitely came to, to follow it up. FEM modeling. Uh, what's, have we got that? I'm, I'm not familiar with the acronym. Me either. <laughs> um, I'm not sure, maybe it's to do with um, basically the elusive, what they call the machine that goes ping. And um, the idea is, if I'm on the right track here, is it's the most difficult question with these shipwrecks is how much oil is still inside them. Um, short of drilling holes uh, in, into the fuel tanks and putting in a um, bit of alkathene pipe and seeing where the oil measures, there's no really um, like industry standard, uh, well, that is the industry standard. There's no non-intrusive way of doing it. They have experimented with um, uh, some some pretty um, yeah high-level kind of uh, physics machines, which send in atomic um, atoms and the different density and these kind of things. But putting it in an underwater system, um, the people who sell the system are very confident it works people who use the system are not quite as confident. So um, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge. And then going back to what Vicky was saying before is that at the moment, you know, this work we're doing, it doesn't have that level of funding that say the British Ministry of Defence or someone does. So yeah, um, definitely, definitely something worth looking at, but the challenge is, is um, yeah. Getting Thanks. that equipment to where it needs to be. I think I can, yeah, I can answer that more if I can see what the question was. <laughs> yeah, just go ahead and look. Um, no, I think that's good chat, but FEM yeah, is good. finite um, element modeling. So it's incorporating the physical characteristics of materials. Thanks. I get. Yeah, I think it's, it's definitely um, something that needs to be taken into account is all this, this work to record the wrecks. But one of the challenges it is, is that we know um, from previous work that we've got about five years until they collapse. Um, so some of this, some of this work, I mean, it's, it's a real challenge between getting the absolute most detailed data possible to make decisions. Um, and then the other side is you're gathering data, which doesn't actually tell you any more than what we already know. Um, if the wreck's going to collapse in five years, is there a need to, to measure every single element? Um, and record it or is it more important to put together a case and say okay well this needs to be pumped out 10 years ago let's let's make it happen so yeah one of those those trade-offs fantastic um more questions for you matt <laughs> do you have any corrosion measurements or rates for the structural elements so like frames of the wrecks as well as the whole plating um because this is coming from David Greger, and he's thinking that there are pro probably particular weak points that control the collapse of the wrecks. Yeah, um, I mean, that work goes back to, to what Vicky and um, uh, Ian McLeod were doing up in the taking the actual corrosion measurements of these wrecks. At a, at a gross scale, um, you can look at the way the wreck is sitting. So if it's sitting upright, 
then the forces involved are going to be um, basically what the, the naval architects um, designed the ship to resist. So it's sitting up. If it's on its side, then all the forces are you know, out, of, out of kilter and you're essentially going to pancake or um, turn the wreck into an accordion. If it's upside down, then you've got a lot of strength in that as well. So you can say without actually um, getting the, the specific details of the frames and all that, that the wrecks that are on your side are the most um, at risk of sudden collapse compared to the other ones. I mean, it would be amazing to have all that detail, but we just don't have the time or the, um, the data on a lot of these wrecks to, to get it all. Brilliant. Um, do you, oops, <laughs> questions are coming in. Do you um do you have a rec or area that is a priority for for the U.S. to seek financial um financial and human resources to address, or not just the U.S. us? Sorry. Everyone. So um, I guess I didn't get to cover it in my my presentation, but of those three thousand eight hundred shipwrecks, um, we've worked to narrow that down to about fifty five shipwrecks throughout the Pacific. Um, as I said before, 19 of these are located in Chuk Lagoon. Um, there's the Bikini Atoll um, shipwrecks that were tested during the nuclear testing there. That's another, uh, I think, nine shipwrecks, Solomon Islands, uh, Papua New Guinea. So we have these kind of concentrations of these shipwrecks. Um, in terms of the highest impact to people, it's probably the Chuk Lagoon shipwrecks are the highest risk, um, potentially followed by the Solomon Islands and kind of cascading down. But, you know, it's, it's such an urgent issue that any, any sort of um, priority for funding is we could, we could make use of it <laughs> very quickly to, to get out and, and assess these wrecks. I think we've got one, time for at least one more question um, here. And there's a question that's, you're, um, you've been looking at the oil spill, uh, oil issue, but have you also considered ammunition as well? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of these ships were either naval vessels, which have um, you know, ammunition that they were holding when they went down and potential um, uh, enemy uh, munitions that were fired at them as well. And they're, they're potentially very, very unstable. Um, so what we have in part of our team at Major Projects is we have a retired Canadian clearance diver, um, Austin Beard, and he's a, an amazing guy. He's, he's run kind of UXO projects uh, through, throughout Canada and the US, and he's our advisor for a lot of this work. And it's something, before we dive on a shipwreck, we have um, hazard, uh, accidental hazard analyses and um, what's the other one? Basically, uh, an understanding of what unexploded ordnance could be on the wreck, how to um, interact with it. Most of the time, it's do not interact with it. And um, yeah, put it in that way. So it's very much a consideration that we, we have in, in our work and something that we have to be careful of going forward as well. Thank you, Dr. Matt Carter. It's been Absolutely riveting. Um, and the feedback thus far, which you can see on the, the um, group chat has been nothing but positive. So I expect you'll have a lot of um, follow up emails after this conference. Um, so I really, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity. And, um, you know, it's such an important part of what everyone's doing is to bring maritime archaeology into these contemporary issues, whether it's climate change, potentially polluting wrecks, whatever. I think this is where we all need to be pointing our, um, our rudders. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, so I think we'll move on to our next presentation. We, we have, um, oh, go. we've got Mr. Dean Greenow, who's Assistant Aboriginal Heritage Advisor for the Center of Marine um, Socioecology and Aboriginal Heritage Tasmania. And today, uh, I think Matt, sorry, you're still sharing your screen, I believe. Sorry, <laughs> check my emails. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, um, so today Mr. Greeno is going to be talking um, to us about the 
Utruita, traditional practice, maritime archaeology, climate effect, and how they are connected. Um, so thank you, Dean. Um, if you want to go ahead and share your screen with us. Yes. Hopefully. <laughs> G'day, Deb. How's it going? Hello. Thank you. Uh, hopefully that works. And we can play. Okay, if you got just checking to make sure that's all working. Looks good. Awesome. Uh, today we are meeting on um, Luchabuita, Tasmanian Aboriginal land. Uh, the Palawa people belong to the oldest continuing culture in the world. They've cared and protected for this country for thousands of years. And for many years, the Palawa country referred, Palawa people, Pakana people referred to this land as the Palawina Lorena Kanamaluka. Hi, welcome. And today I'm just going to do an anecdotal walk through connections of um, marine archaeology, climate effect, and um, indigenous traditional indigenous practices. Um, there we go. <laughs> Just a brief overland, uh, overview of what we're going to do. Um, so this is me. I'm an artist. Um, I'm also a qualified aircraft maintenance engineer. I worked for Qantas for 20 uh, plus years. Um, uh, I am a um, specialist in um, airframes engines, but that's just on the maintenance side. <laughs> the calculations are done by some other wonderful professionals. All we did was apply it to the real aircraft and made sure that everyone flew out and flew back and uh, landed with uh, the appropriate amount of wheels <laughs> and engines. I'm um, also a qualified builder and, uh, as you can see, a bit of an artist. Um, so these are just some um, uh, ephemeral artworks that I do, which is often done with the driftwood that um, appears on the on the shore. I just walk around the shores for a few days with a camera and a drone and uh, with the appropriate permits, of course, and uh, just build these in situ and watch them fall down with the tides. And this is the wonderful grandmother, um, Truganini, which is our traditional um, person that I'm uh, related to. Sorry, these are a bit quick, but <laughs> I didn't have time to set the slide timings, but we'll get there. So one of our traditional practices is mutton birding. This is the short-tailed shearwater, flies from the islands of Flinders Island in a figure eight around the Pacific, uh, does a lap of honor up through J uh, Japan and all those wonderful places. This is one of our traditional practices, which as, um, as people who were affected heavily by colonialism in the, uh, in, a, in, the, in the 17th, 18th century, uh, this is pretty much one of the few um, industries that we could use to survive uh, due to restrictions and, and, um, and all the things that went with colonialism. Um, so thankfully, um, we, th this traditional practice, along with uh, some of the others that the ladies did, uh, is the reason that um, I'm able to sit here and speak to you guys today. Um, my connection to the water is, is long and deep, and we'll get to that soon. This is the uh, Tamer River estuary, which runs from the city of Launceston to the tip of the uh, Bass Strait. Uh, and I'm from Flinders Island, which is uh, an island in the middle of Bass Strait. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a really good map. And um, I was <laughs> trying to connect the dots. And this is uh, just some of my artwork. That's actually um, white paint on bull kelp. The canvas itself is a large piece of bull kelp the sticks around the outside are our traditional spear making material. And the um, picture itself indicates to the left, a traditional man with a Tasmanian tiger, the fire in between with spirits that connect ancestral and current lands. And the young people of today listening to the ancestral stories through um, what we, uh, most traditional people around and indigenous and first peoples um, look at as spirit or cleansing smoking uh, fires. 
This wonderful picture is of a close up of the Mariner shell. And this is where we start connecting the dots between marine archaeology and cultural practice and uh, climate change. My mother is a traditional jewellery maker using these wonderful um, King Mariners. I can't give you the <laughs> actual tax, uh, scientific taxidermal name because I'm just going to trip over and fall on my face because I can't say it properly. <laughs> um, and these shell necklaces. Uh, these necklaces have been made in um, Pakana lifestyles and, and uh, traditional practices for, uh, well, recorded in Tasmania for at least 16,000 years. They've got um, um, shells in the museum, shell necklaces in the museum that go back at least four and 500 years, which they've been used as trading goods, as you can see. Um, uh, but if you look closely, at the tips of the mariner shells there, they're different colors. Normally they hold their coloring all the way through. And my mother noticed, this is my mother. She is a traditional maker. Those are all her shells on display in one of her big exhibitions. Of, um, I think it was a 70th birthday exhibition. And about 20 years ago, she was talking to me and said, um, I'm noticing some changes in the shells. And over the, over the years, right up to probably, I think five or six years ago, I actually went down to see CSRO and um, IMAS. Um, we noticed a degrading in the shell thickness. The, um, uh, the, the, so the strength of the shells, um, the coloring of the shells, the weed themselves, the weed that the shells live in. And um, we signified that there was something serious happening. And obviously uh, that particular aspect is climate change. This is where we harvest in the area on Flinders Island. Don't worry, it's not a sacred site. <laughs> this is uh, one area that a lot of people go and harvest. Uh, that's me, my father and my son um, with some several fishing boats in the background. Um, and those are the ribbon weed, which the little mariners grow and live between. That's the uh, green mariner shell that we call them. The king mariners, which are the ones you've just seen, live on a completely different weed and a different um, area of the island and um, mum wouldn't let me show those. <laughs> so um, this is just a little quick video of the, that's the mariners moving around just to show you what they do. As you go to pick them, they run away, which is a little bit frustrating. But you can see there the, the ribbon weed itself is not healthy. There's all sorts of algae and thing on there. Um, there. There's sort of a standard algae that sits over them but we're noticing more and more with the increase in heat and um, other effects with the climate change um, that, that's changing. So I got involved with um, IMAS and CMS and was invited to uh, on the indigenous board to the Future Seas um, uh, uh, conference a few years back, uh, which was, um, it started with uh, the United Nations when, um, when they declared 2021 to 30 as the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. Um, and I, they asked me down to talk, oops, sorry, <laughs> jumped the gun there, uh, just to talk uh, and represent a, an indigenous group. And we, uh, there were uh, 14 papers drawn for this journal and um, they ran each of the papers past the indigenous body. Um, uh, these people were from um, Taiwan, uh, Greenland, um, um, uh, British Columbia, but these are Taiwanese elders, um, Navajo, Maori, um, uh, Haida chiefs, uh, just a big variety of indigenous people. And we just put the indigenous or life world's perspective on the climatic um, effects and their effects. Things like uh, the, the um, Inuit from um, Greenland was saying how the, because of the rebound effect of the ice coming off uh, Greenland and the rising waters, the, 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 now honestly, I can't remember if it was tuna or salmon, one of the fish that normally runs up the river, they're completely changing their process and the way that they interact with the island, which I was completely blown away. Um, and the um, 
the same story actually came from the Taiwanese elder when he's talking about the flying fish, which is not the right name, but he did call them something else. And how the predator versus prey scenarios changing and with the changes in temperature and things. Um, so this is from uh, Dr. Alistair Obday, uh, a, a lovely man who explains this in such a clear and, and, and uh, amazing way. I, I only wish I could have tapped the, his, his wonderful explanation. But as you can see, there's a heat bloom off the east coast of Tasmania, and this is affecting everything, uh, you know, coastal estuaries, uh, ocean, uh, um, uh, ecologies, etc. Now, I'm not sure what everyone's science background is, but if you know the Venturi effect, changes in pressure and temperature and that, Bass Strait is like a big Venturi because it shallows up as it goes past the two islands, you can see just above Tassie, um, and then drops off the shelf on the other end. So um, temperature changes uh, on, the, on, the, on the other side of the shelf are creating massive changes in and around Flinders Island which in effect, uh, using the sounds, is changing how the, um, the shipwrecks, which are all around, I think there's 150 shipwrecks around Flinders Island, some of the most iconic ones, you know, Sydney Cove and the Farson, the Farson I'll show some pictures of later. Um, this is changing the, the ecology, which is changing how our shells grow, and it obviously is affecting um, uh, uh, galvanetic uh, changes in the water due to the uh, pH changes. So, uh, and you can see that there, climate change, movement of heat. I may have these slides all about um, out of order because I was trying to copy them properly from his um, slide presentation. Um, but this, so the changes, in, it changes the circulation of the oceans, the ocean currents, you know, the, the nutrition from the bottoms I'm making to the top. So the, you know, all these sorts of things affect um, ocean growth, o ocean feeding. So the, the conference I was at was talking about a whole slew of things, um, uh, you know, uh, ocean as a resource and all that sort of thing. And I, I'm sure I heard something about um, ocean um, properties, et cetera, uh, heat shut, mixed layer, less nutrition. And here's a sort of a real break. Oh, that's uh, horribly pixelated. Sorry about that. I might have transferred that too quick. <laughs> but it's giving you a breakdown of the shells, skeletons, and 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 uh, carbon and carbon dioxide and, and uh, uh, oxygen solutions and all that sort of thing, all the basic stuff for science, which um, I think Matt was talking about uh, the breakdown, the correlation. I didn't even realise this, but um, uh, the the coral was is sort of self support some of those wonderful Pacific islands because. Um, I know a few of my mates, oh, you know, if climate change is affecting the oceans rising, why aren't these islands being inundated with water? And I said, well, they are, but, you know, due to the way the ocean works, the, the sand is still piling back up because of the breakdown of the reefs. And I said, well, at some point, the, the, the coral stopped growing and, and therefore the, the ability for the islands to back up, which some of them can't anymore, uh, the sand, and then uh, obviously they're going to, we'll have our climate um, refugees occurring soon if they're not already um, so this is uh, a few um, pH changes around variables around Australia and oops, all right, we seem to have ah, uh, and this 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 is uh, the gentleman I was talking about. That's me on the right, the Inuit gentleman Nanook, uh, chief of the Hyder in the middle and then the, the wonderful Taiwanese elder whose name I can't pronounce because I'm just so good at pronouncing names. Um, so the focal point, what are, what are we actually looking at? What do we see when we're, we're looking the connections between these things for indigenous people is life worlds. So um, uh, every, every, every small thing affects every big thing. Um, the seaweed and the correlation which grows on the wrecks, you know, in our case, what, uh, so I'm going to get into my history, but with the farson, which I just realised my slides are now out of quarter, <laughs> the farson shipwreck, uh, I couldn't give you the exact year because, you know, I've done such really good research, blew up in the islands uh, in, in, the, in the late 
1890s, I think it was, or um, and when she she had a load of timber for guns, and um, you know, she pushed up against the sands in near um, Gun Carriage Island, it was called then. And the local indigenous people, as the shipwrecks used to wreck on the shores, would pull the boats apart for housing because uh, well, we won't get into politics, but um, the, the the local Van Diemen government or Tasmanian or Lutherita government at the time were not uh, didn't prioritise uh, indigenous housing as the top of the rung. So we 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 had like my grandfather, great grandfather, you can see here. Uh, so all my grandfathers are fishermen, they're, they're um, uh, crayfish, shark and scallopmen. So this is my great grandfather off uh, actually the very same beach you just saw us harvesting. Uh, he, they pulled two big tanks up off the, out of the wrecks and used them as the water tanks. The baths and that were pulled out and put in, you know, this, <laughs> I can hear everyone curling their eyes up, oh my God, that's, that's, <laughs> that's how it is. Well, this is the practicality of, of, of shipwrecks on, on little islands where the, you know, you got no access to, to hardware. I mean, I remember as a boy, uh, we, we probably saw a boat twice a week, which brought all our, our um, live goods and that over. Um, so they, 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 they um, built, you know, they accommodated all this, like I've, we had anchors and that all through the yards, huge pulleys. I remember as a boy, um, a couple of sheds had great big reams of ropes and so all these things, the dog eyes and all that used to be stuck in sheds and that. And that's marine heritage in, in, a, in, a, in a different context. But at the same time, a lot of it got uh, bulldozed and just pushed into pits in the end because as, as, uh, as these places which were built out of old shipwrecks but also nailed together with asbestos and all sorts of other lovely and non <laughs> heavily carcinogenic lead painted panellings and that, um, you know, um, councils and, and local governments and the wisdom said, oh, no, you can't live in those. We'll, we'll bulldoze that and we'll put it, um, give you a nice house. This is my great grandfather. The, uh, my uh, heritage there is the, uh, they, they help people learn to navigate. When I say great grandfather, he died in 78. This is probably uh, in, the, in at least 1940s, 1950s. This is my other grandfather. Um, so he uh, grew up in Ponza, hence my surname. It's an Italian surname, but I am indigenous on both sides. Um, and he was a, a crayfishman who, um, uh, they were both shipwrights and, and, and skippers. And obviously they also would salvage bits and pieces off boats to continue to repair their own boats because uh, a 12 hour, uh, 12 hour navigation and, and steam to Flinder, uh, to Launceston and then all the costs associated with shipwright and fixing boats, it was cheaper for you to um, do it yourself. Uh, this is my father. Uh, he also was a skipper of a boat, um, uh, crayfish, scallops, and I can't think of the other thing you did towards the end. Uh, this is on the um, bark, the James Craig. Um, that's the only time you'll see me at the wheel. <laughs> and this is my son, one of my father's mate's boats. This is the Farson, one of old ship off the gun carriage island, which is long since now broken up. This is probably her in a heyday as a wreck. I remember it when it was at this point. Um, I haven't been to round to that side of the island in many, many years, but last I heard she had broken up and sunk below the surface. Um, and I was kind of shocked because it only actually happened in, in most recent years. And when talking about corrosion of boats and uh, Matt was mentioning about oils, I mean, I don't think this old girl had any engines, but uh, I do know that out of the 150 wrecks there are all sorts of ages around Flinders Island including quite a few fishing boats, which went down during the rather competitive scallop, scalloping period. So where to now? We're, um, for us, it's, um, it's, it's uh, in, uh, an oral history investigation. Uh, so we're talking to elders and finding out how um, they interact with the mariner shell, what their observations of mariner shells have been over the last um, 10 to 25 to 30 years plus. And the idea of that is we get um, multiple perspectives from around the island seeing changes in mariner shells. Mariner shells are like your little 
uh, um, the uh, is it the canary? Whichever bird they used to put down the mine shaft. Sorry, I, I, I couldn't remember which one it is. They and that's what IMAS and CSRIO and CMS are looking at. That the, the mariner shell seems to be flagging and reacting according to the ocean acidification changes. Um, and we're also comparing that to the shells which are in storage in the museums, which uh, we notice in uh, the, they're going to the synchrotron to do thickness uh, thickness analysis of the shells, uh, a lot of NDT work on, on uh, as far as they go to reflect these things. Um, I'm not sure what time I've been going here, Deb. Have, have you got an eye on the time there, Cobra? <laughs> yeah, you're still fine. We've got a few more minutes and then we'll um, open up to some questions. Yeah, so um, I, su I suppose uh, uh, the shell harvesting, the mutton birding, the sealing, all these things are traditional practices which have been around for over 14,000 years plus. Um, it, yes, it is colonial ships we're talking about which are smashed in on the lands and it's the reflection of change of colonialism but um, uh, climate change is affecting everyone. And uh, as much as shell necklace making is women's business, it is a women's practice only, um, the, the fix for that is, is everyone's business because to support the women's health and the mental health and all the connection to traditional practices, I've started uh, this project, which the, um, the oral histories is just the pilot program for um, a potentially larger uh, Australian research grant, which will delve into things like aquaculture and uh, you know, ways of protecting mariner shells, marine parks, marine, and all that sort of thing that go with protection of uh, resources. The mutton birds are obviously tied in with that. Now, that, on that side, no, so we're talking climate change, but also pollution. And um, I can see a pollution. Um, would affect the shipwrecks as well because you know you're not sure what is being suddenly dumped on what site and not all um, shipwrecks are actually in the water but I think some of the ones that are pushed up on land could be protected probably a lot better as well. Um, uh, like uh, the mountain birds do a lap of honor around, um, the Pacific, around the Pacific in a big figure eight all the way up to uh, Alaska and past Japan etc. Um, the Birds are coming back later each year and they require more krill for energy. And when they open up their stomachs, they're full of microplastics. So another traditional practice yet again under um, climate or, or a pollutive um, uh, you know, uh, effect. So life worlds of indigenous people is being interfered with by climate and, and pollu pollution effects, but the connections to uh, at least marine archaeology here in um, in Tasmania, but on, on Flinders Island, uh, are quite close. Uh, a lot of people, um, especially around Cape Barron and Lower Flinders Island, would not have had houses or shelters if it wasn't for the shipwrecks. Um, that's probably a 50-50 a deal. We had um, <laughs> the pirates of Bass Strait, which were, yeah, they were relatives, um, who used to like... Um, emergency fires and draw boats in and then um, yes uh, they were um, pulled apart and used for their um, gains in, in a rather ill recruited manner. Um, that, that's pretty much all I've got on that connection. Um, I'm hoping I didn't whiz through it too quick because <laughs> I think I have. <laughs> uh, unfortunately that's my excellent nerves that <laughs> throw me under the bus with that. Um, and I'm happy to take questions early if that helps in any way. <laughs> well, it's absolutely fantastic presentation, Dean. We really appreciate that. Um, I think that as archaeologists, we are often quite focused on that tangible aspect of cultural history and what's being impacted by climate. But the life worlds of the Indigenous peoples is such an important um, core component of this you know, holistic understanding of what's actually happening to heritage full stop. So thank you very much for speaking today. Um, we already have some questions for you, um, which you can read in the group chat. Um, are the shells also a food source or used exclusively for jewelry? 
Uh, the sh the mariner shell probably could have been a food source, but honestly, um, if, if you're going to spend the time uh, harvesting those shells, you would rather wreck something else for the the food source. It, it is a big snail in the king mariner. The little ones, not so much. Uh, no, mostly uh, warreners, um, abalone and limpets, the standard sort of shells we have around the shoreline are used for a food source. So yes, they're, they're used mainly for uh, jewellery um, and it's um, also a, a ranking thing. So who gets the king mariner, the queen mariner, there's five different mariner shells. Um, who gets what shell is ranked according to age, your uh, status and all that sort of thing, yeah. Uh, what else have we got? Yeah, yeah. So the climate change effect, uh, we've seen that also with the, so you know that as water uh, uh, heats, it expands. So it's changing tides, which means um, we're noticing uh, to go and harvest, we're, we're changing the points that we go into the water to harvest and when we come out. In some cases, they're shorter um, because, you know, hot water expands, so the tides are, uh, 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 often lower in some cases than normal, which also means that the, we notice the shells are migrating into different areas and things like that. Um, and I, I've noticed, uh, actually funny enough, in the last five years, the three old wrecks which used to be around what we call Yellow Beach and um, around one of the other bays, they've all disappeared. And these were just uh, regional ship, uh, regional uh, fishing boats which are just washed up and um, the skippers are giving them, giving them away and we'll replace later. So that was an interesting thing. Um, we've got a few more questions. Um, yep. You mentioned the microplastics, but yep. uh, Richards is wondering if you've noticed other changes to the mutton birds that might be related to climate change. Uh, yeah, so the patterns are that they used to arrive back dead on time. Um, and I'm gonna get the date wrong. I'm pretty certain it was the 24th of November, but I could be wrong. Uh, they bit literally millions of birds would arrive within that 24 to 48 hour period and start setting up nesting. And they're an amazing bird. They try, travel thousands of kilometers around the Pacific Islands, come back to exactly the same borough that they left. And this is something CSIR and everything have done research on many, many years. Um, last year, they come back two weeks late. Uh, I forget whether CSIR or IMS, they were at a boat just south of Macquarie Island and they noticed um, and they're aware of the mutton bird uh, migration and that, and they said they'd noticed this massive, massive flocks of birds going down, topping up on krill and coming back to the island. So yeah, it's starting to throw, appreciably throw out um, standard systems that the birds would stick to. Um, the, the chicks are coming out um, intermediate. We did use, you did use, used to always lose chicks in the burrows anyway that's the nature of the beast of, um, of being a, um, a beast in nature is that, uh, you know, not, not all uh, parents can feed their birds and they, they pass away. But um, that was different this year. They, 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 they found the full uh, fed birds were, were um, um, lesser to a degree because obviously we've still got mutton bird harvests going on because it's an industry now. Um, and all the lower barriers around the islands are often filled with penguins. And there was an appreciable change in the fact that the penguins are a little bit further up, which means less birds. Um, yeah, so the numbers are significantly different, yeah. That's really interesting. Um, we've got time for one more question. We have one from Hans. Um, yep. The indigenous knowledge and examples like this um, do help us understand the larger context of climate change impacts. Do you encounter cases of oral traditions or other examples which shouldn't always be shared with the outside audience? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, there's many. I, I, I go through and um, believe you me, these stories are cold to the bone. <laughs> the fact that I've given you pictures of harvesting areas which without names and things like that, um, it still required me seeing elders and talking to you know, relevant practice and, and traditional makers. But uh, there, there were, it was interesting. I, I went to a custodianship conference in uh, Mossman and we found there are connection stories for the Wiradjuri people to the Pakana, and we're talking a story which is rolled over from 14,000 years ago plus when Bass Strait was just a, a lake and the um, islands were still joined. There's a story, I won't share that with you, but at the moment, more and more and more of these things are coming out and the connections and the dots are all starting to line up. 
and it's it's um, it's hair raising because as you can appreciate that in itself is a reflection of climate change because we're talking about the rising seawaters um, yet again and changes in practices you know our, our um, my ancestors were isolated here that many thousands of years ago and continue to do their own practices where the guys on the mainland adapted with the changes and, and um, you know that they had uh, the, the Dutch East Indies and all these people were you know, five or six hundred years ago uh, popped in on the west coast and there was the uh, Indonesian folk who come down the, the middle and they traded probably hundreds you know I think they're 700 to a thousand years ago so there's that there were these very recent changes in, in, in uh, indigenous practices on the mainland, whereas uh, uh, Pakana and Palawa peoples stuck to their traditional practices as long as, uh, well, right, right up to, um, we've only really uh, just contemporized it now uh, for the sake of uh, continuation of culture. That's all really interesting. All right, we're gonna sneak one more question in. Um, do you feel that ocean acidification and increased ocean temperatures are the main causes of changes in color and the deterioration of calcium carbonate regarding the mariner shell? Or do you feel that there are other underlying factors tied to climate change that are the main causes of changes in the color of the, um, of the shell? A uh, combination of all, all of those effects and, and other things because uh, we'll, we'll just look at that same bay. Those uh, trees you saw around the background, that it was predominantly very low seaborne, uh, sea, seashore shrubbery, but they're all grown. All the hills behind, up through what we call Vinegar Hill, the, there are uh, forest trees there now which have never been seen in any of the generations of people that we know. So that's causing uh, freshwater retention which is causing more uh, focused fresh water coming out in certain areas because people are obviously building houses there and that's all uh, feeding into the great big uh, swamps, et cetera, down the coast. So what's happening is these freshwater, these focal freshwater uh, 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 rivers are coming out into the ocean at, at points where often where the mariner shell, it, and mariners aren't in every spot around the bay, they're only in certain spots, uh, but it happened to be right where these creeks which are now grown into small rivers, uh, uh, come out and join uh, fresh and salt water, which is changing. As I was, I didn't quite get a good. There's a good picture I have hidden somewhere <laughs> uh, on on the algae, which is growing on top of the weeds. And those are the green mariners I showed you. What I haven't shown is the blue mariners, which yet again I had that discussion with the elders, and they're in a completely different weed, completely different system. And they they are really under duress because the algae is wrapping right around. They the the blue mariner goes uh, the green mariner goes into the sand during the night and off tide. Blue mariner just hangs on the weed and just sort of uh, goes up and down depending on the tide. So the numbers are changing. The shells themselves are getting. Uh, this year we found uh, like acidic uh, pitting as though someone had dropped high molar acid all over the shells and the usual nice brown coating, which we take off to reveal that metallic uh, fluorescence underneath, that's actually coming off. We're finding them uh, naturally in, uh, in, the, in situ with, the, with their protective coating missing. So yeah, massive changes, massive changes. Dean, this has been absolutely a spectacular talk. Um, what, what you and the elders and your um, indigenous people know and understand about the changing climate is, um, we look forward to <laughs> learning what you can share with us moving forward with your um, pilot project. So thank you very much. For and if anyone has any questions for Dean, feel free to um, put them in the chat and I'm sure that he can answer them. Um, oh, no Pleasure, thank you so much. All right, so, um, I'd like to um, introduce our next presenter. And we've got uh, Mr. Andy Viduka. He's a PhD candidate in archeology span at the University of New England. And today, uh, Mr. Viduka will be talking about GERT, Scientific Divers, a conservation focused citizen science pro um, program for underwater cultural heritage. And Dean, if you could... S I think it's stop sharing your screen if possible, Dean. And maybe Andy, you can set, perfect. Thank you.
Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Deb and McKenna before I start for organising this event. Really appreciate it. Um, so let's see if we can get this started. Right, before I get into the talk today, um, I just want to uh, reiterate for people who didn't see David Gregory's wonderful talk yesterday. Um, in that, David flagged the UN Decade of Ocean Science um, thing. And we just want to uh, emphasize for people that the, the Decade of Ocean Science and the Decade Network Group, which was created, is there for people to share their information and to create a platform. Um, it's really a major focus for us to try and ensure that we build culture into this coming period. Uh, so please, as you develop your programs and projects, reach out through to the Ocean Decade Heritage Network and try and uh, make sure that your information is put up on the platform so that over time, we can actually certainly contribute to the decade's outcomes, but specifically also show the importance of cultural activity and cultural events in the marine environment and the way they can contribute to science through the marine environment. Um, okay, that's the ad for ODHN over. So let's get on to the talk today. As many of you have seen through the last presentations of the other day, as well as today, we're all very much aware of a changing environment. We're aware of extreme weather events. We're aware of massive erosion going on around our foreshores. All these things are having a, a clear impact on people who live around the place. And that's going to drive people's perceptions and things what's going on. So we're aware of this, but what's happening to our underwater cultural heritage? So we're still in this space where we have an insufficiency of data to really know what's going on. But we have other sources of data that are starting to come out that are telling us things are going badly. That includes the Integrated Marine Observation System. So this is an IMOS network in Australia, which is a series of buoys around Australia, which monitor certain parameters, or incredible range of parameters actually, including salinity, turbidity, temperature, pH, dissolved oxygen, just keeps going. So all very useful parameters all being monitored and have been being monitored now for between 20 and 15 years. So a massive facility of information available. And what is the IMOS network starting to tell? Well, it's starting to give us hot spots of where activity are happening. So now we know what's happening to our marine environment. We're starting to get an idea that it's not good. So as a background to this talk, I just want to give you some of the framework to where GERT came from, and I'll introduce GERT properly in a moment. So in 2001, the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage came into being, and that convention's focus was on in situ preservation as a first option. In situ preservation requires certain things. We as managers need to know about the site, about the condition of the site before its location, before we can actually say we're managing it. In the Australian and New Zealand context, which is where my PhD focuses in, we've got about 10,000 shipwrecks around those two countries. Now, to give you a bit of context, both Australia and New Zealand are in the top 10 countries in the world for an EEZ, which means an exclusive economic zone. So that means there's an a very, very, very large body of water in which shipwrecks and other underwater cultural heritage are located. It's a huge area to encompass. So here we have UNESCO saying management of heritage in situ is the first option. And then the physical reality is that our shipwrecks are everywhere. They're located at different depths in different environments away from points of civilization or access and opportunity. So how are we going to achieve this goal? In 2018, a piece of legislation I co-drafted uh, came into effect, and that ensured that the protection of underwater cultural heritage recognised the role of the public. So into that legislation, I drafted the third objective, which was that the management of heritage would include public access and for scientific and recreational purposes. So this was a huge change, and it's possibly the only legislation I know of for underwater cultural heritage which actually recognises the role of the public. So we've got the convention, we've got a large underwater cultural heritage resource really distributed everywhere. We've got the, an act which is saying we need to manage these sites but recognise the role of the public. 
And we know that to actually protect and manage sites, we need to do and document the sites to actually understand what's going on. So there's our framework. So within this, we have a clear need to understand the condition of shipwrecks and, and those factors that are driving preservation or deterioration. So I was sitting there thinking, 2016, 2014 even, how are we going to actually achieve this? Because to date, it's been too much something that was being done by too few people and the results have been too little to actually substantially base any decision making on for, from a global or a national underwater cultural heritage program. So I thought, well, what about if we engage the public in this? Can the public actually contribute meaningfully to data or, or collect data that's meaningful that can improve science-based decision-making? So I decided, uh, and I was interested in citizen science, that I would actually take a citizen science approach to this. Now, citizen science is often characterized as a part of public archeology. span It is a very different part of public archeology, span and that's a whole conversation we could go into separately but I decided to take a citizen science approach here. So we understand why we want to monitor. We all get the idea that if you've got, if you met annually monitoring or regulatory, regularly monitoring things, you can actually compare like with like, and so you can actually see and understand change over time. Monitoring, that's a simple concept. But why are we monitoring? What's going to happen? Well, one of the things is people need to make decisions based on that information. Now, Tom Dawson yesterday in his talk, he was actually flagging the fact that Scottish Heritage is using uh, their monitoring program in effect to actually make decisions about what sites can be managed and what sites will not be managed. That's effectively what's going to happen here in Australia and in every other country in the world too, because not everything can be prepared. So, as with the idiom, and Dean was just trying to mention this idiom as well, the canary in the coal mine. The canary goes down the coal mine and it's sensitive to pollution and therefore is more likely to die and therefore alert the miners to leave. Well, we needed a canary in the coal mine for understanding what's happening on underwater cultural heritage. We need something that's a very short, sharp, visual way for us to know that change is occurring that we need to respond to. And so that's what I started to think about. So I developed GERT. And GERT is effectively designed to be a canary process where those people in the public who are interested and engaged in underwater cultural heritage can use a system or can use the 59 unique fields of data that are included within GERT and actually collect that data in a systematic manner and then can have that ability to compare one year's observation observations with another year. So that was the basic premise of this. And of course, if you're monitoring the condition of sites, as you're monitoring those conditions of sites, then you can extrapolate what's changing, whether it's from climate change or other things over the future, or you could look back and see the effects of climate change on sites through a different lens. So the important thing about developing GERT was quite simply to actually look at taking very basic equipment that people would use in their open water dive course, and then incorporating that into how they would go out and do their citizen science. So GERT uses the standard diving equipment effectively, plus a camera, scales, slate, and a tape. So that's what's going on. When I designed the GERT process, I designed it using the rule of thirds, expecting people to spend a third of their time planning a project, third of their time diving and collecting data, and a third of their time actually um, utilizing and processing that data. So that rule of thirds was there. Through this work, I've realized that uh, what I'm asking of people is very much in line with the concept of the super volunteer. And the super volunteer is somebody who will go out and actually spend an enormous amount of time in a place undertaking a voluntary acti activity. In the GERT concept, I consider a super volunteer as someone who actually can complete the entire GERT process, but they bring with it their technical knowledge, their skills as a diver, and their diverse experiences in life. The GERT process is quite simple. I have effectively what's an eight step process where five of those steps are related to diving and three emphasize the importance of post-processing of data. 
uh, a guideline sheet that's very long is um, uh, available for anyone to access through the GERT website and people can please feel free to download and read. And then I've created five other survey sheets. Each survey sheet includes fields of data that I want people to collect and populate in a particular manner. And I explain and teach how to collect that data. So it's systematic for everybody. And in that, there are 59 unique fields of data. Recognising that we want to have a holistic environmental understanding of what's going on on a marine site. GERT has got a bolt-on process for going back. So if we go back to the last slide, you'll see that in step five of that process, there is a marine environmental survey. GERT actually has taken, well, I've taken the policy position that what would happen is because there are so many citizen science projects running around the world related to marine biology and things, it's an opt-in thing for the GERT member. So I encourage all GERT members to use at least a citizen science project on any site that they adopt using that process. And then they can attach that information to the site survey record. And we can share that information back to the other citizen science project, as well as the data we've collected from GERT. So that's a process that's already in place and, and working with GERT members. So from a maritime archaeological conservation perspective, I, I effectively say that GERT is just collecting the data that's physically observable and measurable that's in the open water environment. Um, I, I have given that number approximately a 30% figure. That's just a, a number I ascribe. Uh, but I, and I do that recognizing that whenever you're having to go and take measurements or sample, core sample, you have got a lot of post-processing and analysis work there, and that's a substantial amount of work. So that this percentage of effort is reflective of, of the level of time of that. But GERT is not meant to be a full conservation site survey. GERT is meant to give us trend understanding of what's going on on sites, and that trend can be done by any member of the public who is trained in the GERT process. That releases us from the number of people who are available to do a full conservation survey, be they conservation scientists or archaeologists, and it rapidly explodes that to a larger population who are actually geographically spread around any given place, who have more near access to any site. So it definitely changes the game for us. GERT in its design capitalizes on the recent technological advances uh, to bring spatial scale and longevity to underwater cultural heritage monitoring programs. You know, the methodology is actually designed to be a real-time scalable program, which offers sort of options and priorities for data collection, uh, dependent on the time, available bottom time, you know, conditions on the site, visibility, and the actual individual's knowledge. So I'm just going to show you a bit where we're up to with GERT so that you can actually see what's going on. So I've got permission from uh, Chris Underwood and Mark Beatty Edwards from NAS, and I use the term adopted within the GERT um, project, adopted rec, because um, that was a lot better than me saying meet my special new friend or something like that. So I, Mark and uh, Chris agreed to let me use the term adopted for GERT. The first step that members do is they register their interest to join, they go through the training, and then once they go through the training, they can actually go into the GERT website and they can choose to ad adopt a wreck. Now, within that, I've loaded up all the shipwreck resources that I can find in Australia and New Zealand and elsewhere so that the members within the study area could just go and highlight any one of those sites. If a member has a site that wasn't actually within that data set that I had, then I could simply create a site for them quite simply using the GERT process and just put a, a location there, which they could then adopt. In this instance, I've also got GERT members in other parts of the world, and they have entered through that process. And there, as you can see at the bottom of that screen there, there is an ability to see reports. So as GERT members actually complete reports about the condition of their site, they're accessible to the public through that button there where they can go into it. In relation to the survey reporting functionality within GERT, um, this is within the test environment. It's going into production this weekend. This is the latest version of the test environment you're seeing now. Members just click on and enter a survey. Um, 
the survey is built in such a way that it's actually going to capitalize on uh, making sure people are systematic in how they're entering data so that we're comparing data in a quality way. The last thing we need is, is data to be entered without a metadata guidance structure. That would just make it in, non-interpretable. Uh, as has been discussed endlessly today, you know, GERT survey report looks at biological, chemical and physical parameters of sites. Um, these things are all done. It, it uses scaled photos to support uh, condition and it uses scaled video to show underwater um, uh, conditions of the site and biological growth and it uses photogrammetry. So it's got a spectrum of different aspects to it in there. Uh, qualitative and quantitative data is collected and then that data is inserted into here so that it, again, it, it's accessible. So here you can see that GERT capitalizes on using uh, drop downs so that effectively people are, are using the same language. So for future, um, when we're going down and when people want to actually uh, query the data set and they want to draw out data, the fact that it's in drop down will mean it's much more searchable. I also use a lot of tick boxes and controls so that we're actually able to give a, 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 the ability to control the quality of information that's coming in but also make sure that we, we are reflective of the fact that people are being giving some subjective data at different phases and the quality of that subjective data. Um, I've put this in here for my friend David Gregory, who's interested in, in the movement of borers into the Baltic. Um, in this one here, as David can see, GERT can quickly be scaled up to include multiple photos, so with a scale, and then that can show uh, where people find evidence of fouling organisms or whether they actually find evidence of marine borers on sites. And because this is linked to an inbuilt GIS, um, you've got the ability to show that from a spatial thing, from a geographical spatial thing, but also because, you, as you'll see, you're able also to pinpoint exact locations where you found evidence of that uh, activity or infestation. One of the critical things that I mentioned was, you know, GERT capitalised on that recent technology. So in and around 2000, uh, 2000 and whatever, 14, I was using um, photogrammetry in Cyprus to actually uh, work with a friend, Carrie Fulton, and we were looking at um, an anchorage off Cyprus. And so with that knowledge, I came on, and I thought, well, we can teach GERT to anyone. So we can teach uh, photogrammetry to anyone. And so we do. Um, we now encourage the members to actually collect data about features and or the entire site, dependent upon the complexity and the post-processing time and their capacity for that. We allow members to then add to this by actually doing photo condition reporting of particular features, which again strengthens their, their observations and measurements. So for example, they can do scaled photos of a feature that they see on the site and they can show shape and exposure and movement of sand and sediment. So we're very much interested in the scouring patterns around sites so that we can see the exposure of elements or the burial of elements. So it's not here to teach you about GERT, but if you're ever interested, you can come online. Um, currently, GERT has a range of members uh, in Australia and New Zealand uh, and, and a, a number overseas. Um, some sites have been adopted uh, the adoption of sites have been limited by two things. One, we had a, a bit of a failing with our email server late last year, which we yet to totally resolve. Um, so that means the website's been a bit dead in the water for me to control. Uh, the other thing, of course, is COVID has somewhat limited play in the last year, impacting on the rollout of the Citizen Science Project. But on the whole, it's going OK. Where we have done surveys, you can see that the colour indication there is aligned to the legend. And so we can actually ask GERT members to indicate threat. And I'll go on to that in a minute. People can click on the C report of that site and they'll get they'll go to the pull page. Sorry, I forgot the order of this one. This one's actually here to show that where 3D models of sites are created, there's a GERT website to host those 3D models as well. Um, in the case of doing the reporting here for the site, we use teach um, effectively how to create 3D models. And then we also uh, get in and help the members to actually attach images showing the condition of a particular feature. Uh, also, they can attach archival images or video to that feature, and they can describe what they're seeing in the survey point location. 
And so obviously you can do year in, year out, these similar models with the same photos taken from exactly the same depth in the same direction, using the same scale. And therefore you've got very, very comparable uh, data sets uh, of condition of sites supported by qualitative and quantitative uh, uh, information collected on the other sheets, survey sheets. Um, in this instance that you're looking at the Rainbow Warrior, um, this is sunk up in the Cavalli Islands of New Zealand. Uh, we did this survey back in 2019 with two uh, GERT members, Brett Sutton and Cam Lowe. Um, you can here see a, a condition photo of where the bomb damage was on the site. And then you can go back to the archival image as well. So, so GERT is a way of easily interpreting for the public um, facets of the site, as well as for other specialists. A, a critical thing too in GERT is the fact that GERT has other dimensions. So we are dealing with stuff in the coastal environment. In this instance here, you're seeing um, a model that was created during the pilot project phase, which ran from 2018 to 2019. In that pilot project phase, I had a, a very, very enthusiastic uh, chap who wanted to uh, come and adopt a site, but because GERTs uh, only focused on people who are over 18 and capable of diving uh, with their qualifications of diving, his daughter, who was 15 at the time, couldn't do that. So we agreed to make sure that he, he could use an intertidal site. And this photogrammetry was generated by his 15 year old daughter the first time she ever did that project. So absolutely fantastic for that. And it was a very nice part of the pilot project to see that success there. Um, more recently, early part of last year, um, I was working at the Great Barrier Reef with a commercial dive charter company teaching Gert off the boat. And with that, we were able with very limited time on site to actually collect sufficient images to produce photogrammetry of the Gothenburg wreck site. This has enabled the first site plan of this site ever to be produced, with, which is actually um, intelligible and readable. Um, there's been some wonderful sketches which are incredibly erroneous. So, so this is uh, an example of the power of public archaeology systematic process to inform science-based decision-making in underwater cultural heritage management. So terrific result there. In regard to the threats and likelihood of threats for assessment, um, members are asked to identify things that they've seen on the site, such as the anchor damage or anything else. And then they uh, give that uh, likelihood and consequence. And eventually through moderation, we actually ascribe a value. So the member might come in with high, and then I might write back to them after I see the submit a report in the workflow. And I'll go, oh, you know, think about this, think about that. and then it can be moderated through that manner. Um, the survey report, once completed, is available for anyone to view online, including with the video, embedded video and things like this. Um, but if you need to take a, a report, you can actually obviously take a PDF a download of the report and attach it to any statutory database that's available. Um, that covers off on everything. And so therefore this information is publicly available and can be shared and be put into any statutory database. So there's no limits on that. It's a key part of GERT to be open and publicly accessible. Um, currently we're looking at GERT now in operating in 10 countries. Um, as I said, the website's not working, so I can't show you where those other sites are, are, are being adopted. But so that's, a, that's something that's happened within the two and a half years of GERT's full-time operation. Um, and that's pretty much where we should leave it now as I'm probably running over time. So thank you very much for listening to me about GERT and um, I, I, you're always welcome to look at the website and uh, please get in contact with me if you've got any queries. Thank you, bye. That was fantastic, Andy. On um, citizen science and the power of public archeology. span um, so it's obviously, it's not just a tool for, um, what you're doing is not just a tool for public archeologists, but it's also something that practitioners can take on board, looking at those um, templates that you've made for collecting data and uh, utilizing their volunteer services. Um, so it's, it's phenomenal what you're doing. Um, we have time for possibly one question, if anyone has a question for Andy. <laughs> yes, uh, well done as always. <laughs> um, we've got uh, a couple a couple questions popping through and I'll let you um, have a quick read of them if you want to answer Andy. Um, but 
basically how does GERT treat release or protection of sensitive data? So there's a functionality. So because we've got an online relational database, um, let's say you've got a site or, or, or sites in Hawaii that you want to keep publicly excluded, but you're also interested still in engaging the public. What we can do is we can just add a data field which allows us to select whether a site is actually going to be visible or not to the public. Uh, and that's just an addition. I mean, that's the incredible flexibility of citizen science is it's adjustable based on the research agenda of a citizen scientist or a, of an output goal. So we can, we can modify things to actually meet those goals. And as I said, like for Dave Gregory's citizen science requirements in the Baltic, we can emphasize um, for people to actually modify. The, the community can be out diving, looking for those elements which are showing Torito worm, and then we can be spatially mapping what divers are seeing in real time, and he can be correlating that to salinity, temperature upgrades, all those sorts of things. So we can, we can be seeing the trend behavior, but getting the, the ground truth proofing of, of that as well. Um, and a perfect follow-up question is, have you seen any increase in vandalism sites from making the information public and engaging with such a larger um, population of citizen scientists? Yeah, I actually think um, that's the opposite. Um, basically, having an informed and engaged community who are out in the water and know what they're doing, they actually control and regulate the community who would do illegal activity. So you find that you've got the inverse. And indeed, um, the view that that you would actually hide things and keep them from the public is probably against modern compliance theory, where you actually try and assist the majority of the public to be compliant. And through that, they influence the people who would be likely to be non-compliant. So, so a bit old school thinking, but I understand where you're coming from, but it's more important that you can actually not only witness it, you can report it, you can document it, and, and should you be able to find information, it can be shared with everyone. So everyone's aware of damage and danger. So it's not hidden and it's not limited to just a few select individuals who are cultural heritage managers to know that there have been negative impacts on sites. You're making the information public and everyone knows about it. Thank you, Andy. It's fantastic to see how quickly your program has grown over the last two and a half years. And we look forward to seeing how many more um, citizen scientists are created as a result of this, this great project. Uh, yeah. I mean, we're up to 130s, but as I said, um, that year, year out of play has sort of slowed it down a bit. John, you can't say that. <laughs> you can. All right. Um, and we agree, so, everyone. Anyhow, look, absolutely love it. And as I said, the, the 59 unique data fields we've got are very similar to the ones you're looking at. There's, cor there's overlaps and things everywhere here. So there's a lot of opportunity for everyone to leverage off each other and make good outcomes. So that's the nice space we're in. That's brilliant. Well, thanks, right, Andy. Well, I'll go. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely day. <laughs> Don't leave yet. There'll be more questions. Um, so. We'd just like to invite our last presenter, um, Dr. Brad Duncan, adjunct senior lecturer at the University of New England to speak next. Um, and today, um, Dr. Duncan will be presenting the Turning Tide, Maritime Riverine Heritage Sites and the Climate Change Indicators in New South Wales and Victoria, Australia. Over to you, Brad. Thanks, Deb. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we yep. can. Oh, great. Good. Yeah, I've had computer problems. Um, look, first off, thanks to the organisers for inviting us along to this. I think it's one of the best in initiatives come out in maritime heritage for a long time. Um, and I'd also like to pay my respects to Aboriginal elders past um, and present in all of the areas that we've been working with um, that I'm going through in this, in this particular um, PowerPoint. Um, what I'd like to say to start off with, this is a project that's been done jointly in my role as the um, Senior Maritime Archaeologist with Heritage New South Wales. Uh, and also through the University of New England in conjunction with Dr. Mart uh, Professor Martin Gibbs and Professor Martin Toms. Um, what I'm going to cover is, is there's a whole pile of bricks that are, you know, that everyone's covered in this, uh, these presentations today. But what I want to do is concentrate on, river, on wrecks that are either in rivers or maritime heritage sites that are in rivers or in very coastal uh, margin, marginal areas. Um, what I'd say, hang on, just, it's working, sorry. Oops, sorry. Quickly. Ah. sorry, I've had a few computer problems. Um, where this 
where my interest in um, climate change first came about was in 2012 and 13, we had a series of quite significant storms up and down uh, the New South Wales coast, um, which revealed significant numbers of wrecks. And we're talking about 20 wrecks or, um, came out of uh, from underneath six metre high dunes. Um, the sites were exposed in areas where we didn't know that there were wrecks before. Uh, and often they were in conjunction with uh, what they call East Coast lows here, which are intensive um, low pressure systems that go through and cause um, quite extensive damage along the coastline and, and, and generate quite large seas, in some cases up to 12 or 13 metre high seas. Um, some of the sites that, so what I want to do here is, uh, first off, I want to say I'm not a coastal geomorphologist, but we've been working quite closely with people who are. And so this is just a series of observations of sites that can be affected by climate change and may be affect, affected by climate change. One of the things I would say that was when we first started looking at this climate change was a bit of a dirty word, something that, that um, government didn't necessarily um, want to admit to or was interested in. Um, and so um, we've, uh, we ended up doing this sort of thing through um, University of New England instead. Um, one of the first types of sites that we had that came out was four shipwreck sites at a place called Belongeville Beach at Byron Bay. Um, these sites came out from very significantly um, eroded sand dunes in that area. Um, you can see, can you see the cursor here? So this is the site of the hull of one particular wreck that was exposed and over the space of about a week and a half, that, um, that site um, exposed and eroded to, to an extent where the whole side of the wreck actually subsequently collapsed. Now, um, this is leading to you know, quite extensive undermining of those sites some, uh, and leading to a lot of erosion along those areas, which is um, um, causing the sites to um, wash up and down the beach as well too. Um, and then the next day, they disappear. Um, so one of the things that we were interested in with, with these sites is that, A, could we, could we predict when these um, weather events would come about um, that would actually affect these wrecks and what were they, um, which would then allow us to actually a, um, plan our, our um, investigations of shipwrecks up and down the coast. We could go in after these large storm events and B, we could also look at, at um, documenting those sites and looking at how those sites were affected by those storm events over time. And this is something that we've been subsequently doing. Unfortunately, the events aren't necessarily happening every year. Um, we're looking at probably about a three or a four year cycle for them um, to come out. Um, one site in particular that we've done um, quite extensive um, documentation on is one called the Buster, a very interesting shipwreck that's uh, at a place called Wall Gilga, which is just north of Coffs Harbour for anyone who knows New South Wales. Now this site is normally, it's quite stable. You can see in this site, in this image here, if you can see the cursor on the, on the right hand side, in 2009 there was a significant storm event came through which actually started to um, degrade the um, stability of the site. Normally, uh, as you can see on the left-hand side, there's only iron um, uh, rider frames, um, these that, that come up and they're exposed. Um, but we, we found that over the, the um, period of about two to three years, um, the dunes started to wash away. And as the dunes started to wash away, there was extensive Torito worm damage was starting to be caused to the site, even though it was exposed in an intertidal um, in an intertidal area, there still seemed to be enough Torito worm damage occurring in those areas as a result. Um, but more significantly, um, the wreck over time started to develop a riptide around it. So what, what happened was that the, the waves would come in on one side of the wreck and would go around it and come rushing out the other end. Um, what that, the effect that that had was that it started to degrade the wreck on the inshore side and planks that were as large as keelsons on most vessels um, were starting to pop out of the, out of their frames and actually fall off and cause, a, cause um, um, safety hazards going up and down the beach as they floated away. We came up with a, a, a um, scheme that we were looking at to try and protect this site. Where there was a couple of different things that we were looking at trying to do. Um, they include um, sandbagging the site, looking at, at um, a, a bunding bag that we could have put along the edges of it. Another option was to actually knock the iron, uh, knock the iron um, bolts out of some of the, uh, the frames on the wreck and to put an iron um, supporting beam down one side to hold the planks intact. In, in um, and when we went back up the next day to, to actually start measuring up for this, 
again, it changed overnight and the site was buried instantly. Um, there were also other types of sites in this area, including um, Woolgorga Pier and, and Pullen's Ramp, which you can see on the left-hand side here, which were exposed in the same um, erosion event. Um, and the other types of risk that this placed our, <coughs> pardon, pardon me, um, the other types of risk that this placed on this maritime heritage was that then became um, a risk um, to the local population and the councils were quite keen to actually start removing these sites as a result. And it took a lot of um, negotiation with the local councils that let the natural processes um, stay in place and let it sand back over again, which they did within um, a couple of weeks. Now, one of the things that we realized as a part of this shipwreck and the ongoing works there was that it was almost a cyclic sort of nature of what was going on. We could actually predict what was happening here. So you'd normally get an East Coast low, um, an intense low pressure system come through. It would normally occur at the top of the king tide in conjunction with the king tide, which would then strip away the sides of the sand dunes. And within a month, um, you, the site would normally bury again as the king tide would come in, grab the collapsed sand, sand dune and spread it back out over the site. Um, another site that we were looking at was one um, which we've only just recently identified was at the Minamara River, which is just south of Wollongong. Um, what we were trying to do for this site was to um, actually look at why it was being, ex being exposed. There was only two exposures known in the last 20 years. Um, and so we started to look at um, satellite imagery and um, I've only put Google Earth imagery in here, but we've got better stuff um, you know, that we're using a bit more um, um, recently. Um, and what it showed was that um, the initially flood event would, would seem to be, if you look at the, the upper right hand side, a flood event would, would expose um, part of the site, which is marked with the, oh, sorry, which is marked with the two pins um, on, on the photograph there. Um, and then over time, that would weaken the sandbar entrance. And, and the, um, so the floods caused the initial exposure of the site and, and it would sand up and then it would be exposed again. Um, quite surprisingly, the next time we went there to have a look at this particular site, which has since been identified as the Rangoon, um, the Rangoon hit, um, this, hit the um, small stack island that you can see on the right hand bottom photo there and broke up and actually it was washed inside um, the, the river entrance. Um, what we were quite surprised to find out was that, that it, the um, site was actually being affected by East Coast low events as well too. So we were getting what's called overtopping happening in this area where the waves were of such significant si size, um, in this case, pretty 10 to 15 metres high in some areas down the coast. Um, they were actually going across the top, at the top of the site and completely stripping it bare. And we, we, we um, realised that this was the case rather than flooding because there was actually no um, silt in the site at all. It was completely exposed, whereas last time it had been washed clean by flood and was full of silt. And this time it was only had sand on top of it. Another type of scouring that we were getting on sites was um, exposure of, of previously unknown wreck sites, which had actually been abandoned by the riverbanks in various rivers up and down the coast. Um, at this stage, I should, should say to you, don't know me from um, overseas, um, in New South Wales, we've been doing uh, what's called the New South Wales Rivers Project, where we've been looking at riverine heritage sites, which is probably an, a, a very underutilised and underexplored area um, within, within, particularly in our country at the moment. Um, one of the things that was happening there was that, that, that in conjunction, again, we think with East Coast lows, um, there would be massive rain events would occur upriver. And as a result of that, there would be intense flooding up and down the coastline. Uh, and, and, and down through the river systems. Um, in, in some instances, up to 14, 15 metres high um, increases in river levels. Um, and this is exposing sites along the, for, along the, um, the river banks, which had previously been incorporated into reclamation areas or buried naturally as part of the site formation processes. Um, additionally, um, it, another river that we went to, the Kalain River, um, again, is just south of Sof Coffs Harbour. Wrecks, the, the flood level in the rivers was so intense that the whole wrecks were being picked up and actually flushed outside into the sea and, and cast ashore onto the beach as a result. And again, you can see this, um, this wreck here is, um, we're unsure what it is. I think it's actually a scow, um, a flat bottom vessel used for crossing bars. And you can see it's been completely flipped upside down and dumped onto the beach. Um, 
another aspect um, that we've started to realise just recently, of, I think it's, it's very sort of prominent in the news in Australia, especially is the, the potential for climate change to affect um, Aboriginal um, uh, heritage sites in particular. Um, this is one example. Um, it's, this is probably the one of the most blatant that, I, that we could come across because there's the potential not only for um, Aboriginal um, dune sites to be eroded and Aboriginal dune, oh, sorry, dune sites were actually used by Aboriginal people ex quite extensively um, for burial sites. Um, there's also places where there would be middens left over from food and scavenging and, and eating, et cetera, and artifact scatters, but also coast inundation of terrestrial rock art sites. And what you can see here on the left-hand side is um, um, a, a long view of, of the fish that you can see on the right. Um, and this is in the Hawkesbury River. It's only about a metre and a half above um, water levels, current water levels in that region. And it's at, at imminent danger of, of coastal inundation if, if there's any significant rises in the rivers. Um, additionally, I used to work at Aboriginal Affairs down in Victoria um, at one stage. And so uh, well aware of the impacts of climate change in that area as well too where there's less water is actually coming down the, the riverine waterways in a lot of areas, not, not only through the rivers, but actually through inundation, um, which is leading to water, uh, to um, the drying of waterways and sites where there's um, the potential for buried um, um, or submerged or organics still in those sites. And the, the site I'm showing you here is Lake Honda, um, which is where there's intense Aboriginal occupation and an uh, amazing fish trap system that dates back um, several um, tens of thousands of years. Um, it's also leading to greater exposure of these sites after, when, after initial flood currents and surges come down the rivers, because a lot of the times these river sites are actually bone dry, which I'll show you in the next slide, um, slide, slide after this. <clears throat> um, one of the other things that we've been considering here as well too, is that the changing impacts of river flows and conditions in Australia, it's always a big, uh, a, a big issue. Um, there's a number of anthropogenic um, issues to do with river, river flows, which I won't go into at all here. But what I would say is that there's a, what it's led to in this country from climatic conditions, I feel, is there's uh, low and changed river conditions and increased tidal ranges um, that are actually affecting rivers in two different ways. So you're getting less water in the inland areas and you're getting more water potentially in coastal areas. And so in the inland areas specific, specifically, you're getting um, um, decreased oxygen levels in areas. So you're getting um, changes in environmental stability. So we might've had a site that was previously actually underwater um, for most of its life. Now it it's, has a constant cycle of wet, dry, wet, dry, wet, dry. Um, there's also the potential for black water events to occur, which happened in the Darling River only um, a couple of years ago. Um, where there was massive fish, fish kills. Now this adds to um, not only um, to the increase in organics in an area, but it can actually lead to um, the incidence of acid and sulfate soils and the disturbance of acid sulfate soils within those regions when they're, when they're later flooded, which is, has um, corrosion on shipwrecks, especially on seal shipwrecks down, downstream. And from a, um, the reverse perspective, when you were looking at um, increased tidal ranges coming up the rivers where um, a lot of the oral histories I'm doing with people up in the northern rivers in New South Wales are talking about the presence or the increased presence of Pareto worms in areas where they never existed before. And this is due to the, the raising of, of um, sea levels in inundating areas further up the river and having increased salinity in those regions. So you've got different types of um, invertebrates and vertebrates actually getting into those areas and some of which can affect the sites. Um, another effect that we've noticed as well too is the effect of bushfires. And so one of the things that we, we saw when I was working in Victoria was that um, you not only have the, cat the um, catastrophic effects of a bushfire as it goes through um, an area, but subsequent to that, the first rain you get, it leads to this massive, corro massive erosion of um, uh, valley areas and riverine areas that, that may be previously dried. And it then leads to increased siltation in that areas as well. So, and, and we're unaware of what the effects of that is aside from the erosion at this moment. Um, this is a really good example of a wreck that's actually in the, in the, um, the Darling River system, which is um, what uh, part of the Murray system, Australia's longest uh, river system, which goes about 4,000 4, kilometers inland. Um, 
This is a site that we actually visited um, last year, just before the COVID um, uh, restrictions came in. Um, the site, it would normally be a completely submerged, probably under about two or three metres of water. Um, due to the effects of drought in this area, this site has actually been bone dry for the first time in, in um, living memory. Um, and you can see the effects on it when you go and visit it. It's had a wet, dry, wet, dry. So the the iron, the iron components of the wreck are, are quite badly degraded, but you can also see the effects on the, the organics on this site where the, the timber is actually um, completely dried out. It's often 39, 40 degrees in this area, and it, which is not um, very conducive to the survival of organic material in those regions. And it then also exposes it to bushfires. And as I said, um, um, this site is, 15, it's 15 metres to the top of the bank, and it's normally at least half full in the river in these regions. Um, another site, a uh, series of sites that we've been looking at are um, graveyard areas for sugarcane barges and are associated with the sugarcane industry up in the Clarence River in, in um, northern New South Wales. Um, these sites, I think, pre present um, an ideal opportunity to potentially look at climate change in, in the area as there are multiple graveyards of very similar vessels in, in the same region, but in slightly different environmental contexts. And within, um, within this region of the state, there are several rivers that have exactly the same barges, um, um, but uh, different, um, different latitudes going up and, down the, um, up and down the coast. So there's the potential here to actually take into account the diversity of the environmental factors and uh, where these similar sites occur, but in different locations. And to be able to potentially, I don't know, Vicky may be able to comment on this later, to, to see, um, to take out the effects of local influence in those regions, and then to be able to potentially see whether um, you may be able to assess whether climate change is a factor um, on degrading these sites. Um, we've recently had killer floods in New South Wales. We've had just about every river in the states peaked at least 10 metres above um, its normal flood course. And so this again has been associated with East Coast lows and the, the associated deluge of rain that goes with it. And um, this just gives you an idea of some of the types of wrecks that we've been looking at. So we've got a variety of wrecks that include iron frames, iron top sides, completely iron vessels, completely steel vessels, and we've got examples of all of those in at least three or four different river systems. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, one of the things I'll say with this is that um, we, uh, after the flooding event that we've just had, only pretty uh, a week and a half ago, there's been massive exposure of sites up and down the coast. Um, again, the buster has been totally exposed and we're unsure this time whether it's been exposed as a result of the floods or whether it's been as a result of um, um, large seas. So I think it's actually a combination of both. What it's um, given us the opportunity to, to do, and people have mentioned this before, is that um, we're starting to use photogrammetry to look at site change over time. And so the buster site is one of those sites that can be partially exposed or it can be totally exposed. Um, the last time it was it's completely exposed, we, we took a full photogrammetric model of, of it. Um, and we've, we are also getting our local rec spotters, which is a citizen science program that we've established to get eyes and ears on the ground up and down the state for when we can't get into those regions to take video and um, which can then be turned into photogrammetric models to look at change around the state. Um, so the, the, cracker, the, the kicker for this is, what we need here is these are a whole series of, of observations that have no real scientific value. So what we need to have is a systematic approach to determine if, if climate change is real and or whether these are actually long-term cyclic events um, that are occurring up and down the coast. Um, as I said, many of these sites have never been seen before. They're being exposed for the first time in living memory. So is that in itself an indicator of climactic change? Or is it an indicator of long-term long cyclic change that's going on up and down the coast? Now, we've been working quite closely with the Manly Hydro Hydraulic Laboratory and the Coastal Survey Unit, um, and in addition with Martin, Professor Martin Toms from University of New England, to see whether we may be able to put together a predictive model to actually um, work out when these types of events are going to occur. Um, and also to see whether um, the effects of those sites themselves on whether they're actually having impacts on the rivers themselves by, by being um, where they are. 
Um, I'll leave it there. Sorry, it wasn't very structured. I've been a bit sort of um, um, off kilter today, but um, is there any questions? Brad, that was brilliant. Um, thank you very much for that. You've already got your first question. I was wondering if you could elaborate on the sources of the acid sulfates you mentioned. Uh, yeah, when we when I was working in in Victoria, um, we we had a a whole pile of of, of um, uh, development applications that we were working with down there, and so we were dealing with a lot of the local scientists, and they were talking about that when you get organics that have actually been covered over in the rivers and then covered over by a layer of silt, they develop um, they can develop like a I think it's a sulfuric acid underneath there, and if um, when you um, put structures to within those uh, those areas um they can it, they can be dissolved so you can if you put a bridge structure into an area where there's acid sulfate soils it'll completely can completely de uh, demolish the concrete structure um or or, uh, or significantly weaken it within the space of a couple of years and so there's there's the then they were talking about the potential there for it to actually affect aboriginal sites and and um, also, the, the possibility that you know if it gets washed downstream, it actually may affect um, other um, marine heritage or, or riverine heritage sites that may actually exist close to it. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, silence, gold. You see, we've got a bit of a <laughs> issue. We've got a minor technological issue over here. So there are additional questions. If you would like to read them from the chat, that would be quite helpful at the present moment. <laughs> sure, that's it. <laughs> There's no more. <laughs> well, I think your presentation is fantastic in the sense that many of us are so focused on what's happening on the, in the ocean that we forget um, or we often forget that these water systems are so linked and that the environmental um, factors that the, the severe weather, et cetera, um, does have a detriment, detrimental impact on those sites upriver, um, which inversely has an effect at those sites just at the mouth of the river as well into the ocean. So it is, and it's quite interesting how you're, it's that question is, is this climate change or is this cyclical? Um, and we really look forward to seeing where you take this. Yeah, well, I'm hoping, hoping I've, I've talked to Ian and I've talked to um, um, Vicky about the possibility of going and taking corrosion measurements on those vessels in the Clarence as a start to actually see whether we're seeing, you know, any difference in corrosion, um, um, corrosive effects happening at different parts of the river in the Clarence. And given that we've got, you know, one graveyard's got like 43 wrecks in it and there's about eight or nine graveyards in that same site. I think there's the potential to actually start looking, um, you know, to, it's exploratory in a way. I don't know what we could tell out of it. And the scientists could tell me more about it, but I think there's the potential there to do a lot more than we are. Um, yeah, look, I've done a lot. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Andy. Yeah, I've done a lot on oral histories. Um, a lot of, I don't think you can do the sort of work that we're doing, particularly in the rivers, uh, without relying on oral sources. Um, I think that's one of the things I first looked off, look at when I'm not only looking for sites, but trying to understand, you know, how they got there and where and what they're doing there. Um, one of the other things that we're we're looking at with Martin Toms is the whether you can actually look at the whether you can actually look at changes in the rivers itself by looking at the location of where the wrecks are, um, and whether the wrecks themselves are actually changing the geomorphology of the river as a result. And there's one particular mm. graveyard that we're looking at in. Um, the Clarence River near Harwood Island, where you can see there's three distinct dumping events, and you can tell they're distinct because they've the um, there's a, been a build-up of mangroves every time you put a, a you, you put a number of wrecks in that area, and there's you can see that <clears throat> the first dumping is is 10 meters or 20 meters in in from the current edge of the river river um, bank, and then the next one's five or six meters out from that, another one 10 out from there again. So um, yeah, it's an, it's an interesting area of research. Um, sorry, I'm a bit off my game today. I, I had to take my son to court this morning because he had gone and um, got himself a traffic offence. So I'm a bit off my game today, so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm normally a bit more, um, um, yeah, got my words together, so yeah. Brad, are you happy to continue taking questions? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. 
All right, well, um, we've got another one from Nathan. So, so much for your early part of your, um, you missed the, uh, so much of your early part of your talk could have been about the US's Eastern seaboard. Um, and he's specifically thinking about the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Um, so it's really nice that uh, what's happening here is also happening there or not really nice, but it, you know, we're not alone in this. So everyone needs to collaborate on sediment transport modeling. Um, and I perhaps I think if you invent one, I can steal it. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I think there's the, there's the potential to actually um, to look at this across boundaries, across international boundaries, especially. Everyone's got a river. Um, you know, some are bigger than bigger than others, and some are smaller than others. But we're finding every single river that we go into, their sites in the smallest of creeks that you can think of. And I'm not just talking shipwrecks; I'm talking all the associated infrastructure that goes with it, and everything's got an effect on, you know, how those rivers work, etc. And um, so, yeah, it'd be very interesting if anyone's interesting in doing collaborative work, you know, overseas on similar sorts of sites. Um, and have you planned to compare what you're doing with uh, rivers in the in, in other areas? Yes. Well, I've been trying to get Tony Massey interested in doing the same thing up in in Queensland, and also trying to get Danny to do the same thing down in in um, uh, Victoria, and 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 also Rick in South Australia. So. Um, it, it, yeah, it looks slow going. And look, as I say, it'd be really interesting to actually do have a look at similar rivers and sizes of rivers overseas, seeing whether we're getting disparity of conformity, conformity in, in not only the, the, the types of observations to do with climate change, but the way that people are building vessels in those regions. Yeah, well, we've got um we've got some rivers down here and. Perth, or not Perth, in WA that, you know, we might be keen to, to collaborate on as well. Absolutely. Sounds good. Well, with that, we'd like, um, we'd like to add, to thank um, Dr. Brad Duncan for his presentation and for all of the presenters that have presented um, this evening or morning, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, so we think that, um, I think this is probably a good time, if there aren't any additional questions for Brad, that perhaps we can just use this as a collaborative space now and start a general discussion. Um, because the, the topics that were covered both on day one and day two of the conference were included to, but not limited to the, um, the development of the university programs, focusing on more than just maritime archeology span or marine sciences, but taking that more holistic approach. Um, the coastal and riverine erosion, indigenous perspectives, the development of management principles. We've had ocean acidification and issues with marine biota. We've talked about marine pollutants, which have even brought in marine plastics and um, pollution itself, other than just oils. Um, and we've looked at that citizen science and avocational um, efforts. So these topics have been paralleled in both days in both hemispheres. Um, so I guess the question is, is we're all on the same page. Um, but as the audience, the question is, where do we go from here? And what are, <clears throat> I suppose it's, we're all interested in, in similar things, but are we, is there a, a key focal point that we're missing? Is there something that we should be looking at to do as a, an umbrella interest or project? Or is, um, what do you think that, what do you think the next steps are? And this is open to anyone, so just pop in. Feel free. <laughs> or silence. Hans, you're muted. Can't hear you, Hans. <laughs> Uh, we will try and unmute you if possible. <laughs> no problems. I think we're all having a few technical difficulties. <laughs> Is there anybody else who has um, an idea as to where we can go from here? Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Um, I think we have an opportunity to actually um, sort of identify the issues, the threats, 
and, and what they are. And then, because as we're going to be doing lots of science, we can always pack them back to, to what those issues or threats are that we've perceived. So it could be a loss of uh, inequitable representation of heritage. So it could be around the fact that um, people uh, are being biased. So in the example of Brad's work, rivers, where you see massive erosion on the riverbanks, that's likely to actually impact Indigenous heritage along the riverbanks. Um, more than actually European heritage, because there'll be a lot more of it, but it won't be documented or known. So there's those issues around equity we can unpack around the impacts of climate change and changing activity. We can also look at physical science. So, so I think even understanding all the issues that we're trying to address and then looking at what science we're trying to put into to actually understand what's happening, they're sort of the, the tools, the toolbox that we've got that then goes towards policy and thinking about, well, what can we do to mitigate or change or rescue some of that data? So I think there's those two functions. That, that's probably the first thing, because I think, I don't know if there's clarity on, on that everywhere. Thank you, Andy. Does anybody have anything to, um, to add to what Andy's just stated? Well, I can definitely say that we're, de we're having technical difficulties here as well. Um, Hi, Deb. I have, a, I think it's great. I think uh, it's great that um, so many of these presentations have been tracking towards the same thing, which is seems to be sharing data, centralized repositories for data, um, standard practices, be embracing best practices and thinking about how um, we can share it all globally you know, the discussions of things from pH to and dissolved oxygen, you know, national networks of observation buoys, um, archaeological data. It seems like I, I'm really impressed by all these different initiatives that have thought of ways of gathering large amounts of data and, and placing them in accessible places. So that's, that's a great start, I think. Thanks, Nathan. I guess one of the questions we have is we have um, an issue with everybody collecting data for themselves. There's not a centralized place for us to collaboratively share those data resources. So we're all somewhat inventing the wheel across the board because our interests are aligned um, and some data is made publicly accessible. There are IP concerns with other data. Um, so I guess it, it comes to a question of do we have a uh, is there interest for a centralized place for sharing these types of resources? Um, and are there those concerns for, well, this is my ongoing research or this is data that's been collected in the private sector or um, this is government, there are government restrictions to this particular type of data. So therefore we can't um, collaborate or share. What are your thoughts? Deb, when I created GERT, I made it so that the public can access any of the data that's collected that's put out on the website. So, so as far as it goes, um, the whole idea and the reason for citizen science is to make the data publicly accessible. So people can either mine the data directly by just downloading the information, or they can just ask me and I can send them the raw data. Um, the whole idea of trying to create an informed public about what's happening in the marine environment so that we can get the political will to actually do something to mitigate that is to actually influence the public's knowledge of, of things going on. So not only do you need to train people who then themselves become witnesses and observers to change, but they also interact with other people and emphasize what is happening in their environment. So there is there's a spill on effect here of actually having as many people as possible as part of this story of discovering about heritage. If we limit it to a select group, we effectively will not have a result with government or, or with any funding people to go further. And that's definitely the Australian experience, maybe different in other countries, but certainly the Australian experience. I mean, I think Australia is such a great example of 
um, a long tradition of centralizing data from the AMA database through to, you know, standardized legislation and everything like that. Um, I think you're always going to have a problem with that intellectual property angle um, in some respects. And I think that's the other great thing about what you're proposing with your CHAMPS project is concentrating on legacy data and showing um, how you can maybe um, use it from new perspectives. And I think that using that legacy data is perhaps going to start to convince people to um, unshackle themselves from some of the uh, intellectual property issues that maybe their institutions create for them or their jobs do, you know, thinking about academia in particular. Um, so there's challenges, but I think looking at past data is, is, a, is a really good first step. Yeah, I think because we're all guilty of collecting data over the years with the intent of doing X, Y, and, and Z. And, you know, then another project comes up um, and another and another. And we, we, uh, we never get around to actually processing that data and disseminating that data. And we are continuing to have technical difficulties, so. That's okay. You can hear us, right? <clears throat> Yep. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. <laughs> I think, Deb, Susan, um, I really think your idea of um, the centralization is, is critical and what you and Vic um, presented is what we're looking for. Rather than reinventing the wheel every project, it would be terrific to, I, I want to get you a checklist and not everything is going to fit exactly, but um, it would be so much better if we were all working from the same song sheet and just adapting as it goes. Because um, uh, you know, I think that that's part of it, the centralized point for it and, and having consistent um, usable data. So it's always comparing apples to apples as much as we can. Um, there aren't very many coral reefs here, but we do have, you know, riverine sites, we do have eroding sites, we do have shallow water, and we don't really have super deep water, but um, metal, you know, iron versus wood, we, you know, with our indigenous people's sites as well, um, and all the other things, lighthouses, all the uh, maritime, you know, cultural landscape that goes with it. So um, uh, centralization and consistency would, would go miles. Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, and this is why I think what Hans is putting together with the um, uh, with the, the, the guidance or best management practices um, is going to be quite useful, uh, not just for NOAA and the US, but those of us abroad as well, because we can use that as a foundation. So like you said, we are sharing apples for apples um, and, and looking at apples for apples and not trying to draw conclusions across um, fruits and vegetables, I suppose, for lack of a better analogy. Um, and, and this is where if we, as a community, are trying to investigate what's happening on sites in a similar fashion, we'll have more, um, more to say on a broader scale. Because I guess that's the question is, we, do, we are currently looking so localized because that's what's in our backyard. And that's all we really can do, especially in a COVID environment where you can't, can't go anywhere, um, at least in our case. So it would be quite useful if people are happy to share how they're collecting data or what the data is that's of interest to them or what we can do for you in a sense, if we're going out to a site, what can we collect on behalf of you that would interest you to help you? Because if we're going to a site, we might as well maximize our data collection where possible. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that so many of us who are uh, starting to look into this are really coming up to speed. I know I, I've talked to, to uh, Dr. Van Tilburg about this. Um, you know, we really don't know what we're doing and we're, we're um, you know, the interdisciplinarity of, um, of meeting colleagues and understanding their networks. I mean, I've started to work with some um, um, microbiologists and I'm very impressed by their ability to centralise their data sets, you know, so whether they're logging DNA for microbes in centralized databases that are a part of their sort of um, publication expectations too. So, I mean, I think for us, as we deal with climate change as, a, as, as you know, the biggest issue really uh, moving forward with um, 
preservation of underwater cultural resources or maritime heritage that we should be thinking about those kinds of consequences too you know how how do we share uh, expectations with equipment um i'm kind of clueless with that and trying to learn what equipment we can use and what um expectations for um accuracy etc to make sure that we're uh, logging good data and then um, having a place to put it would be um, the next step, I think. And, and it might be that having that, um, finding now that the, the cloud tends to be where, you know, most people store their data, if it's the possibility of creating a cloud for, you know, global heritage practitioners, um, full stop, something that you know, is cost efficient and effective, that if you are a heritage manager, practitioner, researcher has access to, and where it's a simple, you, it's a simple import of Excel data, for example, the fields, we all use standardized, standardized field titles, and then it doesn't, it's not extra data management for us, but then as practitioners or researchers, we can extract whatever that field of data that's of interest to us and just at, um, uh, acknowledge the uh, the IP owner per se if we choose to use that data and get approval to do so for copyright issues or whatever concern. Um, Deb. On, if it helps anyone, if people want to access the metadata for the GERT um, data fields I'm collecting, if they just go to the GERT website, I'll put the link up on just now, and they can download the guidance form, which includes all the metadata requirements, and um, if people can either ignore them or use them. If I want to, I can see you. <clears throat> Oh yeah. Um, the other thing is that people are interested in that um, on-site conservation survey data form that uh, we um, developed. I can um, well, I'll get Deb to send it to everyone, which is you know that big list of things that we try and measure on every site. I can um, get Deb to send that around to everyone. If people yeah. want it. So it's similar to Andy's stuff. Just a bit more chemistry. <laughs> I think um, Brad mentions that it would be the standardization of data is is key, and that's probably where, um, like so many things, the the vernacular that we use changes slightly. Um, and if we can standardize the language that we're using to define particular parameters, or um, you know the fact that pr preservation and conservation mean two different things. Um, and so the data that we're collecting fits under the correct category and is synonymous Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, then that will help in that data sharing and understanding um, moving forward. Thanks, Hans. Hans, would it be possible to uh, receive a draft of the management plan? And I guess another Hi, question we everyone. have. This is Madeline Roth from NOAA chiming in. Um, oh, sorry. Can you hear me? I'm having some internet connectivity issues as well. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the uh, that's today for all of us. Um, yes, we can hear you. Oh, perfect. Um, so I'm I'm chiming in on Han's behalf. I also work at NOAA, um, and we're currently in the process with multiple pieces of guidance that's at different stages in its development. But we do have some that's going through our internal review and. 
when I say going through, I'm really hopeful that by like the end of next week, we'll be able to share some preliminary documents. Uh, these aren't the climate change specific documents that's still being uh, drafted by Hans, but that's certainly something that I know we'll be reaching out in the future for feedback and an input um, from uh, a wide range of, of practitioners globally. So I just want to give a little bit of that update. And of course, we're always happy for inquiries or people who are interested in that to share it um, widely um, once it's available. That's fantastic, thank you. Um, I guess one of the questions we should be asking is, are, is there an aspect that we're missing in this climate change conversation? Is there something that we, sh we haven't focused on or touched upon in the first day or second day's presentations where, um, where there's a gap in what we're, a gap in our research? We're, we're obviously Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere paralleling what we're doing. So our interests are aligning, but is within this holistic approach, is there something that we're missing and not, not focusing on? And I can't answer that, which is why I'm asking you. I don't want to be crass and capitalistic, but I guess one question I have is um, I'd be curious to hear from people about their funding for pursuing this. It really does seem that funding in places like Australia, it really seems to be there. And I know that there are funding sources in the United States. And as I said before, we're just starting to think about these kinds of things. But I was wondering, you know, funding always seems to be the, the at the end of the day, the challenge with getting a lot of these great projects up. And I mean, David Gregory's work with the Rec Protect project was just, is just such sort of a, a landmark and, but there's money behind it that comes from a place. And so I'm curious about um, if people have thoughts on that kind of, those kinds of angles. Yeah. Our <clears throat> yeah, Vicky, um, our pilot study that we're going to do in the legacy data, it's actually um, CF funded, so funded out of our own departmental budgets. Um, however, um, beyond the pilot study, if, it, it, if it's positive, um, we'll be looking for grants, basically, because we can't make it bigger just based on our um, departmental budgets. Um, especially considering the strategic um, sort of, you know, um, what do you call them? The one, yeah, the priorities, strategic priorities of the museum, which seems to change away from research. So, um, yeah, we'll be looking for funding in the future. So ARC funding, something like that after the pilot study. A bit like, you know, Dave with the EU funded projects but ARC don't tend to give as much money as EU funds and they, you know, but I think um, climate change is becoming a big thing for the ARC. If we can um, pull in climate change to cultural heritage, um, I think we've got a good chance of getting some funding, to be honest. Yeah, and I think we'd also be looking and engaging with um, a number of the stakeholders uh, in Western Australia and across Australia. So. Uh, talking to some of the fisheries, the um, large fisheries industry, as well as the oil and gas and mining industries, because um, they, they're the, the link between what's happening with historic maritime cultural heritage and, for example, uh, offshore platforms and wells, there's a, a direct correlation. Corrosion is corrosion and degradation is degradation and loss is loss. So we can link using um, underwater cultural heritage sites and shipwrecks, for example, as climate change markers, and then extrapolate information and understanding and apply that to more modern industry. We um, might get more funding. Where we'll probably <clears throat> likely get more funding. So I think this is where our interest in the pilot study is, is to see what useful data we can get now to then be able to use that to apply for funding at a greater scale. And that's where that holistic approach going beyond 
just focusing on cultural heritage and going to those more economic industries um, might actually prove to be quite useful. Anybody else going for funding? <laughs> One thing that occurs to me is I really like the idea of the citizen science aspect of all this because once you start with citizen science, you never know who's going to show up as your first volunteers. I know working with volunteers a lot over the years, you'll have people show up that just kind of do whatever you tell them to do, but other people that might show up could be corporate heads or, or uh, engineers or biologists or they might, might turn out to be a lot of the people you really need to pull a package together. So for those of us who are gonna be operating on a little or no budget, but might be able to get some enthusiastic volunteers to participate, uh, we, we might be able to, to really get some programs going. It'll vary a lot by area, I'm sure, but uh, I have a lot of, a lot of hope for the citizen aspect of all this. It's great to see, oh, not Simon by choice. <laughs> well received, well received. Oh, look, um, your, Hans, your comments on the, uh, <laughs> on, on the, the use of intangible resources in cultural heritage and the marine environment, um, that, that is definitely a place where I think we can all, we should all broaden our, um, horizons and perspectives and start to really find fine tune and record some of that information because like Dean um, in his presentation there's so much um, there's such an intrinsic understanding that um, him and his first peoples have on what's happening in the environment for generations which we're only now coming to those conclusions recently and all all we needed to do was ask really um, so that is a very good uh, starting point for many of us. And we like your signage. That works really well. So for those of you around, are there any questions that anyone has for any of the speakers that they weren't able to ask previously? Um, if not, I might hand over to McKenna, if you're still here. She's there you go. still here. <laughs> All right, so would you like me to go forward with some closing remarks then? I think so. I think if um, <laughs> nobody has any other points to bring up, I think we've, we've done a great job in highlighting um, I think aspects that we need to, to do moving forward, you know, looking at that at the indigenous perspectives and, um, you know, finding a centralized way to share data, utilizing similar language, um, you know, cross practitioners, and then hopefully being able to see, to, to read the, uh, the draft, um, drafts from NOAA regarding, uh, you know, best practices. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I still have, I'm having a little bit of internet issues over here, but I would just like to say thank you all for taking the time to come together. And thank you to all of the presenters for presenting today. Um, it was, all the presentations were really meaningful. Um, and I also appreciate all of the individuals who spoke up during the discussion period. There was some really good discussion there in regards to maritime. Um, cultural resources and how it's being impacted by climate change. 
So I would now like to conclude this conference with some closing remarks. Beneath the surface of our oceans and other maritime environments lie important physical evidence of our human past. With just a few examples, including shipwrecks and lost cities, as well as indigenous heritage. However, these aspects of our maritime heritage, as we've seen throughout these sessions of the conference, are at risk of vanishing at the hands of climate change. If our maritime heritage disappears as a result of climate change, so do the valuable lessons that we can learn from studying these complex cultures and the ways in which they can inform us on not only the present, but also the future. I believe that it is through this conference and events like this conference that practitioners from multiple fields of study and diverse regions as seen here across both sessions can come together to better understand the ways in which climate change is impacting maritime cultural resources. This conference provided the opportunity for archeologists, biologists, scientists, as well as individuals from other fields of study to identify the present and future actions needed to take place to protect and manage our maritime heritage. Recordings of this conference session, as well as the first conference session, will be posted on the new St. Mary's College of Maryland Marine Science website. The links will also be posted on the North American Heritage at Risk website and the Ocean Decade Heritage Network website. The recordings will also be shared with everyone who attended this conference as well as the registered attendees unable to attend this conference session via email. I would like to conclude with a quote from Stephen Dean who quoted, archeology span is like a jigsaw puzzle, except that you can't cheat and look at the box and not all the pieces are there, end quote. I believe that an interdisciplinary approach and collaborative efforts are vital to help solve the jigsaw puzzle of climate change and save our archeological resources. With that, I bid you farewell and conclude the Climate Change and Maritime Heritage Interdisciplinary Perspectives Conference. Thank you all so much.